Check, check, one, two, three. Did you miss me? All right. I don't see chairs filled. Are you guys not enticed by the limited edition swag? We're going to kick off right now. Does everyone know Dan Thigason? He will be coming on to give us a nice welcome. So if I could get everyone here to the black chairs, that would be amazing. Because, you know. Because Dan's picture's up. And we'd like your attention, please. And I told you the story about Zoom. You know, when you're talking on Zoom and everyone has their video cameras off and you're trying to talk to somebody and there's no one there, it feels really lonely. You know the song? It's so lonely. I can't sing right now. So very lonely. You want me to keep singing? I'll stop. Yeah. For anyone that would like Ari to stop, please come to the front. I'll keep singing, so very lonely. <clears throat> oh, so lonely. <laughs> all right, give it up for Dan Thigason. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Good morning, and uh, let me start by saying, for everybody who was here yesterday that's come back, thank you so much. Uh, it was a great day yesterday. If you're just coming in, you weren't here yesterday, it's gonna be an amazing day today as well. Um, you know, yesterday we talked uh, a, lot about, uh, a lot about a number of amazing things in, in Web3 and those conversations sort of expanded into things around AI and, and how to do uh, a lot of interesting things as part of uh, a community and as part of the technology that is, that is this thing called Web3 and how we ultimately find ways to commercialize that and, and create value. And um, you know, it was really, really interesting to, to watch everybody as a function of being on stage and listening to what they had to say. But um, I think the really interesting parts are when you, you get off the stage and you really get to interact with people because um, we had this conversation. There's a lot of people that come to these kinds of events that are looking to connect. They're looking to connect with somebody that can solve a problem or enable and unlock for them. And sometimes, you have to go through the process of coming to these events and, and just meeting people. And the law of averages kind of kicks in where you have to meet so many people sometimes before you find the right person that can help you with that unlock. And what's really interesting, um, because I don't have a lot to offer here other than to try to bring people together and you know offer the network. So there is, there is that. Um, but I did get a chance to, to listen to a lot of conversations yesterday as we kind of walked through the crowd during the happy hour, during the social points. And um, I saw a lot of those unlocks happening. So a lot of people that are meeting people that they think can help them progress their idea, progress their business model, progress their, their success. And so uh, I'm super excited to, to experience that. And I hope that today we see a lot more of that again as well as new people are coming in uh, and the people that are here yesterday have a good idea of, of what we talked about and how to turn that into a conversation today. So um, I will hand it back to Ari. Again, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, if you were here yesterday for the second day of attendance, that's fantastic. It's greatly appreciated. If you're here for the first time, it's really nice to see you. I look forward to meeting everyone. Please uh, take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions and talk to people and network as much as you can while we're here. There will be people coming and going throughout the day as we're, we're a full day uh, a schedule here. And uh, Ari, back to you. Thank you so much. Let's give him a warm up hand. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan, for everything you do. All right. So our next speaker is our keynote speaker. His name is Mark Yusko. If you don't follow him, I'm a big fan of him. I go to all of his webinars and follow all of his newsletters and podcasts. So uh, it's a real, real treat uh, to have him here today. Mark Yusko is the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of Morgan Creek Capital Management. He's also the managing partner of Morgan Creek Digital. Morgan Creek Capital Management was founded in 2004 and currently manages close to $2 billion in discretionary and non-discretionary assets. Prior to founding Morgan Creek, Mark Yusko was CIO and founder of UNC Management Company, UNCMC, the Endowment Investment Office for the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Before that, he was Senior Investment Director for the University of Notre Dame Investment Office. Mr. Yusko has been at the forefront of institutional investing throughout his career. As an early investor in alternative asset classes at Notre Dame, he brought the endowment model of investing to UNC, which contributed to the significant performance gains for the endowment. 
The endowment model is the cornerstone philosophy of Morgan Creek, as is the mandate to invest in innovation. Mr. Yusko is again at the forefront of institutional investing through Morgan Creek Digital Assets, which was formed in 2018. Morgan Creek Digital is an early stage investor in blockchain technology, digital currency, and digital assets. Mark received his BA with honors from the University of Notre Dame and an MBA in accounting and finance from the University of Chicago. Please give him a warm welcome and welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm excited because now my dad's going to pop out. Anytime someone says Mr. Yusko, I'm looking around for my dad because um, I, don't, I don't warrant a mister. All right, so it's great to be here back in my hometown. I grew up down the road in, in Kirkland, left a long, long time ago, uh, but always great to come home and, and fly in and see the mountains and, and uh, not recognize any of the places that I used to, to go to. Um, so I'm going to go through way too many slides. Never met a slide I didn't like. Uh, I actually made them all. And if you want them, I'll give them to you. I'll share them. Uh, so I'm going to do something called speed sliding. A lot of slides are going to be up for a second or two. Um, but you don't have to read everything. All I have to see is a color, a line, a direction. Picture tells a thousand words. So I, I talk a lot uh, using the picture. So on the left-hand side, blockchain technology, word cloud. We're going to talk a lot about blockchain today. On the right-hand side is the digital divide. If you ask anyone over the age of 35, who's your broker? I don't know, UBS, Merrill Lynch. How much gold do you have? I don't know, 3 4%. How much Bitcoin do you have? Oh, zero. Are you kidding me? It's a Ponzi scheme. Haven't you heard that guy, Peter Schiff? How often do you use DeFi? What the hell is DeFi? Ask anyone under 35, who's your broker? What's a broker? I mean, I got a Robinhood account. How much gold do you have? Oh, zero. Boomer rocks? Are you kidding me? Haven't you heard that Peter Schiff guy? How much Bitcoin do you have? I don't want to talk about it. Why not? Because it's a really big percentage of my net worth. I'm kind of embarrassed. How often do you use DeFi? Every day. So here's the thing. 37 trillion. Oh, come on. Somebody shudder when I use the T word. A trillion. A trillion, okay? I heard, I, my son sent me this this morning, so this is new to my, to my talk. So a million minutes ago, we were in the middle of the lockdowns. A billion minutes ago was the height of the Roman Empire in 123 CE. But here's the thing, a trillion, which is a big ass number. I'm gonna lock the doors. I'm gonna make you sit here with me for 31,710 years which I promise would be most unpleasant. And you got to spend a dollar a second. That's one trillion. So a trillion's big, but 37 of those babies are going to go from my generation, the boomers, to my kids' generation, the echo boomers, and they are not going to put it in traditional assets. They're just not. So welcome to the digital age, why you can't afford not to have exposure to digital assets. So plan, conceit, and moderation must fail when circumstances are set extreme. It doesn't say might fail. It doesn't say must do a little bit badly. It says must fail. Okay, second, we always overestimate, you guys have heard of this guy in the middle, we overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't, be, don't let yourself be lulled into an action. Four most dangerous words in investing, this time it's different. The secret of change is not in fighting change, not fight the old, but to focus on building the new. The winds of change blow, some people build walls, other build windmills. Now I love the fact that 2,600 years ago, all the wisdom that we think is current was created. There's nothing new in this world. It's all back to Socrates and Seneca. A uh, reasonable person adapts the world, the unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world themselves. All progress depends on the unreasonable person. You guys have heard of this other guy, Jeff. I believe you have to be willing to be misunderstood if you're going to innovate. My buddy here in town uh, was the guy that Jeff came across country, just left his job at, at D.E. Shaw, camped on this guy's couch, said, hey, you have a bunch of rich clients. Can I pitch them? And his pitch went something like this. I want to start a bookstore on the internet. And most people had no idea what the internet was. And it's, you're probably going to lose all your money. That was it. Most people didn't invest. And thankfully, my friend did put in 50 grand, which turned into 300 million, which is amazing. And he sold too early. And it would be worth over a billion today if he had kept it. But he's OK. No one's crying for him. Um, if I asked the public what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. OK? Um, Henry Ford didn't think they needed a faster horse. They needed something else. The advancement of the arts, I love this. The advancement of the arts from year to year taxes our credulity and seems to presage the arrival of a period when human improvement. I loved how they talked in the 1800s. 
If I could talk that way and have a British accent, I would look so much smarter. This guy, basically in 1843, said, everything that can be invented has been invented. We're done. Nothing new since 1843. Don't be afraid to take big, big steps. You can't cross a chasm in two small jumps. Ask Evil Knievel. Most people are like, who the hell is Evil Knievel? OK, look on the internet tonight and think about Snake River Gorge down in Oregon. So this is my pinned tweet on Twitter. Uh, people say, why are you on Twitter? You're old. I love Twitter. It's, like, it's part of the reason I'm here. Uh, Ari's husband met me on Twitter. We went and had beers one night when I was in town, got to meet Ari. She put me on her podcast. We've stayed in touch ever since. Uh, so that, that's my whole life is about Twitter. But uh, the greatest wealth is created by being an early investor in innovation. Making that investment requires you to believe in something before others even understand. You'll be mocked, ridiculed, and criticized for your non-consensus action. Remember, it's the unreasonable person. It's absolutely worth it. So why do the best performing funds in the world, Yale is one of the top three best performing funds in the world, why do they have a huge overweight in innovation as an asset class, 23 plus percent in venture capital? Well, it's because Andy Grove, okay, met this company called Intel, you might have heard of it, uh, few skills as powerful as understanding when things change. The problem is you don't get to wait until you know to make the investment. The traditional way to think about these inflection points is a wave of innovation, and you have to make a decision. OK, is it a fad? OK, if it's a fad, you're too early, and then it's going to be the next big thing, like everybody's talking about AI and chat GPT. I'm so sick of it. OK, or do you wait until you know, and then it's mainstream and you miss the opportunity? The better way to think about it is it's a strategic response to a series of inflection points. Businesses have to face inflection points all the time. And the problem is, if you're wrong, you die. Most businesses fail. Most businesses don't die, though, because they're wrong. They die because they won't commit. They die because they won't act. They fail to act. Now, early investors make the most money, full stop, OK? 1860s, this thing called the telegraph, they strung up some wires, and they were going to send signals across it. People said, oh, that's stupid. Okay? If you put your money in in 1864 and you waited a few years, you made 11,000%, over 110 times your money. And I love the picture on the right. right? This was in 1907, basically predicting what we would do all day, stare at our phone. And the woman on the left, Okay, is receiving an amorous message, so she's scrolling Instagram, and the guy on the right just got the results from the track. Okay, that's, that's over 100 years ago, and they knew that we would all be like this all day long. Um, it's crazy. So when technology evolves, everyone dismisses it because you don't think it's necessary. The telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. Who said that? The guy who strung up all the freaking wires. Duh, head of Western Union said, you don't need the phone. I love the guy in, in the UK. Americans must ha may have needed the phone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. <laughs> really? OK. So Henry Ford's lawyer said, Hank, do not invest. America wants a faster horse. Okay? The, novelty, the, the, the horse is here to stay. The automobile is a novelty or a fad. By the way, if anything's called a fad, you should buy it with both hands. And by the way. Elon didn't invent electric cars. The biggest electric car company in the country in 1903 was the American Electric Vehicle Corp. We had cars that went 47 miles to a charge. You can go to Dartmouth Engineering School and see one in the basement. Okay? What happened is John D. Rockefeller met Henry Ford and said, hey, Hank, you got this new idea. You want to make this horseless carriage, and it's going to run on grain alcohol. No, I have a better idea. I have this stuff that I'm flushing down the river. So I make kerosene for lamps, and I have this effluent called gasoline, and I don't know what to do with it, so I, I just flush it down the river, and the river keeps catching on fire. And that's bad. So how about I give it to you, and you put it in your cars? And we swap stock, and so they got richer by, and that's why we don't have electric cars until recently, because it was better to use gasoline. Now, back in 1949, everyone just knew. By the way, when you know something, don't do it, right? <laughs> Doubt is the best thing when it comes to investing. So calculator any ENIAC today is equipped with 18,000 vacuums, which weighs 30 tons. Computers in the future may only weigh one and a half tons. Everybody hold up your phone. 
You guys are supermen and women, okay? That is a supercomputer that weighs less than one and a half tons. And I love Charles Darwin. Anyone think Charles Darwin's smart? Probably, okay. It's very possible that one machine would suffice to solve all the problems from a whole country. So we probably only need 200 computers in the whole world. We have more than that in this room, right? So when things are called a fad, buy it, right? I've traveled the length and breadth of this country and talked with the best people. I can assure you that data processing is a fad that won't last the year. ADP, ADP is not even a really good company. And it did three times better than the S&P. Data processing, pretty big deal. Okay, incumbents always misjudge the competition. Theoretically and technically, television may be feasible, but financially it's impossible. From the father of radio, of course, he's gonna say television doesn't work. Television won't be able to hold any market after it captures the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Anyone stare at their box last night? Yeah, pretty much. Or streaming or whatever, whatever little screen you're staring at. I love this one. So I grew up here. Many of my friends don't work anymore. They were smart enough to go to work for that little company that was being formed called Microsoft. I um, wasn't that smart because I defend myself. If you ever seen the picture of the original Microsoft 11, you forgive me. We all look rough in the 70s. They just looked rough. Now they're built multi-billionaires and I'm not, so I should not make fun of that picture. But look at that picture tonight. It's, it's kind of funny looking. And, and I didn't go to work there. And Steve Ballmer's mom famously quipped, quoting the chairman of Digital Equipment Corp. Honey, why would you work for that company? No one would ever want a computer in their house. He has 18 billion reasons he was right, mom was wrong. And I love the fact that this company that was started with $70,000 of venture capital in 1957, in 1977 dismissed personal computers as com competition, was then bought by a personal computer company. It's just kind of ironic. Now, innovation and disruption have been driven in long wave cycles, right? From the formation of the Republic in the 1700s to the uh, 1920s, it was all about converting muscle power into mechanized power, right? Slavery, right? Highly top, you know, charged word nobody likes to talk about. It. Slavery wasn't abolished because some people didn't agree with it. It was abolished because of oil. The discovery of oil is why slavery went away, because one barrel of oil has 40 human years of labor. 40 human years of labor unlocked by the discovery of oil. Really important discovery. And me mechanical power and machines, like Henry Ford's assembly line, allowed us to convert human muscle into mechanical power. Now, since 1960s, we started the digital revolution, where we're looking from brain power, human brain power, to artificial intelligence. And ultimately, we're in the middle of the cognitive revolution right now. But what's interesting is this is the sixth epic, right? We had the steam and railways, we had the steel electricity, we had the age of oil, we had the age of information and technology. The next one, which we're in right now, is it blockchain, is it AI? The answer is blockchain intelligence. The answer is yes. So maybe the most important slide you'll see today, actually second most. So my whole life, is about this slide. My dad sold and installed mainframe computers. And uh, 1954, there's innovation called the mainframe computer. The center of the universe was out, run, we're out 128 in Boston. 14 years later, there was an innovation down in Silicon Valley called the microchip. And the center of the universe shifted to Silicon Valley. And these little companies like Fairchild and Intel were created. You might have heard of those. And then 14 years later, and it's always 14 years. Why is it always 14 years? Because young people invent everything because they don't know what they don't know, and they're not afraid. So, you know, the, keep, the people that started Fairchild were young engineers. The people that started uh, Microsoft were young. In fact, true story, why did uh, Microsoft get the contract for IBM, right? IBMers flew out here to meet, and they met with Bill, and they thought he was the coffee boy. True story, they thought he was too young, so they left. They went down to California, where CPM was founded, husband and wife team, and they said, we want to buy your operating system. And the guy was like, and it was a much better operating system. My first computer, K-Pro, was way better. Never crashed. You don't have to reboot it. You don't have to hit the plus, plus button. It was awesome. And the guy said, no, you have to sign an NDA. Like, dude, we're IBM. We don't do NDAs. 
It's like, then I won't meet. So they didn't meet. They flew back here, they signed the deal, and, and Microsoft became Microsoft. So it's pretty cool. So 14 years later, there's a thing in, called the internet. Now, Paul Krugman said, the internet will never be more important than the fax machine. And I was sitting at Notre Dame at that time, investing the endowment. We put a little money with this firm called Sequoia, which at the time was not a household name. They put a little, comp little money with this company called Google, which was not a verb. In fact, our board thought it was a really stupid idea. Why do we need another search engine? There are 20 search engines. We got Alta Vista, we got Web Crawler. What do we need Google for? Because they don't do search. They actually revolutionized the idea of what search is. And that 500K that we put into Google in 1996 turned into $200 million. Should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. Then 14 years later, there's this, this internet, I mean, this mobile net thing. And I remember I was actually back here at Craig McCaw's house, his family office, and I asked his family office guy, I said, do you think the mobile net is going to be as big as the internet? He's like, Mark, are you kidding me? Ask me if they want a computer, like whatever. Ask them if they want a phone. They already got two. I got two phones right over there. I don't need another one. Yeah, the mobile net will be bigger than the internet. And now the blockchain era, which starts next year, is right around the corner. Now, what is it about? It's about connectivity. There were no connected devices in 1954. Mainframes did not talk to each other. It wasn't until the 80s when client server, which was horrible technology, remember the eh, 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 you know, waiting. I had a friend that said that they make their kids wait three minutes and watch that little AOL thing before they get internet in the house, just so they could experience it. And you know, 10 years from now, we'll have 200 billion connected devices. You can't do that with cables. You can't even do it with mobile. You are going to need blockchains. Adoption in technologies, everything happens faster. So everything starts, takes 10 years to get the first 10%, the next 80%, the next 10 years, and the last 10% uh, the last, except in North Carolina where we don't have indoor plumbing everywhere, so it's flush toilet, it's almost at 100%. But everything's happening faster. Look at podcasting and Prime users. They're going totally vertical because things happen faster. In fact, exponential growth is the most powerful force in the world. So try this at home tonight. Take a piece of paper, and I defy, there's some pretty strong guys here, I defy any of you to fold a piece of paper eight times. And I got people who are gonna to try to do it right now. You can't do it. You cannot do it. If you could fold it 20 times, it'd be taller than this building. If you could fold it 30 times, it'd hit the sun. 50, I'm sorry, 30 is the moon, 50 is the sun, and 100 is the known universe. Exponential growth is the most powerful thing in the world. Think about this. A hundred years ago, right, we were just getting these car things. Look at all the innovation over the last hundred years. Now, the thing is, it doesn't happen all at once. And remember pets.com? Total failure. The internet, never going to work. Web van, never going to work. Anyone heard of Chewy.com? Anyone get a box from Chewy.com lately? It's a $20 billion company. It's the same damn company. It's the same company. We just needed broadband. We needed GPS, right? We needed a series of inflection points. We needed 5G. We're getting that. So most valuable companies in the world are not companies. What does Amazon make? They don't make anything. They're a search engine. They match buyers and sellers. It's one of the most valuable networks in the world. Apple is a network. It's not about the little machines that they make. Okay? It's about the network. It's about the connectivity. So the most powerful thing in the world is being a network. Why? Well, when I was growing up, again here, I had a, a pretty strong little ham radio set, and I could hear WGN from Chicago. Think about that. And this guy, Cernoff, came up with a law, and he said, anyone who can hear a signal is a node in a network. And that's how he valued networks. But Metcalf came along and said, well, no, wait a minute. If two people are hearing the same signal, they may connect. So there's going to be more connections. So it's not a linear relationship, it's an exponential relationship. And again, exponential growth is the eighth wonder of the world. But Reed came along and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. The people in this room, okay, all have something in common. You're listening to the, the speakers over the course of the day. But some people are golfers, some people are tennis players, some people went to one school, some people went to another. And the uh, uh, interconnectivity of those subgroups is even more powerful. And I've actually come up with something Fourth derivative, I call it the shadow's law after a friend of mine, the width of the pipes is not the same. The width of the pipes is different, and the wider the pipe, the more valuable the network. So maybe someday you read about the shadow's law. So network effects are cool because our expenses grow linearly. 
In the old days, to be a big company, you wanted to control property, plant, equipment, and stuff. Today, you want to control networks. Why? Because your costs go up linearly, but your revenues go up exponentially because networks grow exponentially. So how much will technology increase over the next 50 years? A quadrillion times. That's 12 zeros, y'all. 12 zeros in the next 50 years. What's possible? The problem is we're not very good at imagining the unimaginable, right? We have to believe in things that we can't even predict or comprehend. So that's where blockchain comes in. Now, blockchain is a really simple idea. It's a ledger. In the old days, I would lend Ari some money, right? And I would write down in my papyrus notebook, because I'm old, right? That she owes me 100 bucks. Now, if I were an unscrupulous person, she'd come back to pay me back 110 plus interest. I'd say, oh, no, you owe me 200. No, I only borrowed 100. It says right here in the ledger. So the Medici's, the benevolent, kind of, Medici's came along 800 years ago and said, ah, we'll solve that problem. R, you keep a ledger. Mark, you keep a ledger. And we, the benevolent Medici's, for a small fee, will decide that the ledgers match. Unless, I'm an unscrupulous guy, I pay the Medici's a little something, something. I write down 200, she writes down 100, and they're like, oh, Mark's book is right. Or you're out of luck, okay? So dual entry accounting. For, look, the fines paid by banks globally for admitted fraud and money laundering exceeds Bitcoin's market cap. That's what they've been caught and paid. Forget what they actually do, okay? So, Dual entry accounting, not really that good, but the banks really like it. And it's been really good for the Rothschilds. The Rothschild family, and it's a big family, the Rothschild family's wealth is equivalent to the bottom three quarters of the people on this planet. Yeah, just let that sink in. One family, three quarters of the people on the planet because of this dual entry accounting banking system. So why is that? Because we pay them for trust. Think about it. I have this recurring nightmare. I go to the bank. Okay, by the way, the money that you put in the bank is no longer yours, right? You got that. You understand that now. It's not your money. It's the bank's money. It's on their balance sheet, and they have a liability to you, an IOU, that 99% of the time is good, unless it was a Silicon Valley bank, and for a few moments, you realize that it wasn't good. But it's not your money. It's their money. And we have to trust that they still have it and that they didn't piss it away on government bonds. But how does that work? Well, I have this recurring nightmare that I go to the ATM and I punch in my code and it says zero. How would I prove it's not zero? I don't have a statement. I haven't had a statement in 20 years, 10 years. Okay, it's their word against mine. I have to trust them. Blockchain replaces trust with truth. In triple entry accounting, I have a ledger, Ari has a ledger, and all of y'all create a third ledger that is truth. Truth is better than trust. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So blockchain will impact every industry. There's not an industry that will not be disrupted by blockchain. Everything in the world will be disrupted by blockchain. We live in the digital age. The largest transportation company in the world doesn't own any cars. The largest hospitality company in the world doesn't own any real estate. We live in the digital age today. We are being disrupted as we speak. And if you're not paying attention to these areas, AI, ML, 5G, okay, this whole China, US thing, <laughs> 10 years ago, the US and China made a decision. What are you gonna be the best in? China said 5G and AI. US said social media. We rock at Facebook and Instagram. 96% of AI citations last year were from China. 96%. I was on vacation in, in spring break, a couple weeks ago down to Costa Rica, in the middle of the rainforest, in the middle of nowhere. Perfect streaming for my son to play video games in the backseat of the van. Huawei router. Not anything else but a Chinese tech. So this is big, but digital assets are right in the middle. I'll make a big statement. The blockchain era will create more wealth than any opportunity you'll see in your lifetime. Full stop. This is the greatest wealth creation opportunity you will ever see in your lifetime because we're decentralizing trust 
replacing it with truth, and we're going to make everything of value flow without intermediaries. And we will strip out, okay, seven trillion, with a T, seven trillion dollars goes into the financial services industry every single year. That's 68 percent of global GDP every single year to Rothschilds et al. for trust. That is going away. And what happened is, up until the printing press, the church had a monopoly on our lives. We were not educated, we couldn't read, so we went to church once a week, and they told us what to think, how to think, when to think, and they had a monopoly. The printing press busted that monopoly. And the monopoly moved to government, state-owned and state-sponsored media, okay? And the internet busted that wide open. In the old days, if I wanted to know what's happening in the Argentine election, what would I do? I would wait for the New York Times to send a reporter to BA, write a story, two or three days would go by, it'd be on page seven, and maybe I would find it in the newspaper. Today, what do I do? I go on Twitter, I go watch a periscope of people standing in line in the rain for two hours chanting Macri's name. I'm like, yeah, that's gonna win. That busted open commerce and media. ABC, NBC, CBS. Anyone remember a show called Happy Days? When I was growing up, Tuesday night, I would be in front of my TV tray at eight o'clock, eyes on the television, they had me. They had my life, they had my eyes, they had my money. All the market cap, ABC, NBC, CBS. Where's their market cap today? Netflix. Streaming, why? Because they wouldn't give up the good to go for the great. They wouldn't give up an ad-based revenue model to go to subscription. So what happened? They got disrupted. What happened to mom, pa, kettle uh, uh, commerce? It got disrupted by Amazon. What happened, what was happening now is blockchain will disrupt financial services. It will become the beating heart of the new financial system. Do we need banks? I had a weird, I had a weird situation. So Bank of America, which I hate, okay, decided that because I'm an entrepreneur, because I own my business, that I'm a bad credit risk for a mortgage that I've had with them for 20 years. Now, what they really said is, you sign 10 years an adjustable rate mortgage, and it's going to go up, and we don't want to refinance your mortgage, because we make more at 8% than at 5 So I said, fine, I'll change banks. Goodbye. So I go to the bank. I go to the new bank. They make me come in person with my wife to sign physical pieces of paper. In this building, there are 10 people, no clients, 10 people. Tellers, they have four tellers, like waiting for the next bank run. That ain't how the next bank run's gonna happen. It happened at Silicon Valley Bank with clicks on a, on a mouse, okay? Why do they have people in a building, heating and lighting? No one should ever go to a bank branch, ever. Banking has been disrupted, okay? How do we get our loans now? We go to an app. How do we pay our bills? With an app, okay? 40% of adults in this world don't have a bank account. Just let that sink in. Three billion people in the world don't have a bank account. Do they need financial services? Yes. Can we give it to them? Yes. How? With blockchain. So blockchain is going to provide a distributed ledger, an immutable, important word, I can't fudge it by paying off the Medici's, encrypted and programmable and trustless network. And so we had the analog age. And remember record albums? Those vinyl discs that we played? Okay, so I had this record album, Foreigner, the original Foreigner album, and I had this, uh, 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 not a roommate, but a friend in, in college, Lucky Rodriguez, and I lent him my Foreigner album. Sucker never gave it back. So somewhere in San Antonio, Texas, my Foreigner album was running around. My wife did make up for it, and she's taking me to the Foreigner concert later this summer. But the analog age gave way to what? The electronic age. So Napster came along and said, all right, Mark, you don't have to have the physical analog album. You can make a copy of it in MP3, and you can send a copy to Ari or whatever. And she's happy, you're happy, but who's not happy? The record industry's not happy, because they want everyone to buy their own album. So what do they do? They shut them down. How do you set, shut down a, a hierarchical corporation? You arrest the CEO. Sean Parker gets arrested. You blow up, the, they blow up the server. So we had the electronic age, and now we're going to the digital age, and everybody has to pay for their own streaming. In securities, it used to be that I took a physical piece of paper, money, and someone else took a physical piece of paper, a stock certificate, we met under the Buttonwood tree in New York City. Unless you've seen the movie Gangs in New York where the people with top hats would come steal your stuff. So let's move inside where it's safe and we can't get rained on. 
And then they realized that could still steal stuff on the way. So let's electronify it. So today, there's a place called DTCC in Dallas, Texas, where every security in the world actually sits. Physical piece of paper, 400-year-old technology. Give me a freaking break. 400-year-old technology. And when I want to trade, OK, I'm trading a QSIP, an alphanumeric electronic code, but they're going to pick up the physical piece of paper from the Merrill Lynch box and put it in the UBS box. Are you kidding me? And they process $1.2 quadrillion a year. And guess who owns it? The banks, of course. So now we're going to go to a digital age of securities. And here's the thing, 14 trillion, there's that T word again, of these assets turns over every year, very profitable for the people who hold provenance of them, OK? But it's bigger than that. 700 trillion, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of art, every case of wine, every piece of real estate, every private business, all of it, everything that is titleable, everything that has property rights, will be a token. What is a token? A token is an entry on a ledger, a permanent immutable blockchain encrypted permanent ledger. All of it will strip out that $7 trillion a year and we will transact value. By 2027, 10% of global GDP will be on blockchains. That's just the start. So Bitcoin, anytime a country transitions from fiat currency, they collapse. That's just world history. You don't have to know about crypto to know that. If you don't believe it or don't get it, I don't have time to explain it to you. Sorry. Satoshi Nakamoto wrote that before he even released he, she, they. Released he identified once as a guy, so maybe it's a guy. It's actually probably four guys. But Bitcoin's remarkable cryptographic achievement, the ability to create something which is not duplicable in the digital world. OK? Lots of people will build business on top of that. Eric Schmidt, you know something about tech. I see Bitcoin as ultimately being a reserve currency for banks, playing much the same role as gold did in the early days of banking. Banks could issue digital cash with greater anonymity and lighter weight. I'll get to that in a second. It might make sense to get some in case it catches on. If enough people think the same way, it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. There were 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them no longer exist. The rest will go away as well. The pound sterling is the oldest. In the early days, one pound note got you one pound of sterling silver. Today, it would take you 174 pounds to get a, sterling, a pound note. So commodity-based currencies are good. Fiat currencies, which can be created out of thin air, no, not so much. Which says, but Bitcoin's not a currency. There's nothing behind it. Anyone got a green piece of paper in their pocket? I don't, I don't care money. But anyone have a green piece of paper? Pull that out and, oh, but it's backed by full faith and credit of the United States. No, it's not. If you hand that to the government, what do you get? Do you get gold? No. Do you get silver? No. Do you get a share of tax revenues? No. Do you get anything? No. And in fact, if you go to Israel, they want yellow pieces of paper. And if you go to China, they want red pieces of paper. It is belief and custom. That is all a currency is, OK? The Economist, 30 plus years ago, said that we would have a global currency. They called it the Phoenix, OK? Pretty good, 30 plus years ago. Took 20 years for Bitcoin to come along. Satoshi Nakamoto created, and then Scientific American said it will be the future of money. Now, I think it's funny, it's always a gold coin, because there's no gold and there's no coins. It's like when they called uh, uh, Madoff a hedge fund problem. There was no hedge and there was no fund. I mean, the guy hadn't made a trade in 13 years, and there was no legal entity. He was just stealing people's money. So here's the thing. What about Warren Buffett? He says it's rat poison squared. How do you know what rat poison tastes like unless you're a rat, actually? But then he doubled down the other day, right, and made it said it's worse. And his partner, Charlie Munger, said it's like transacting in newly harvested dead baby brains. WTF, Charlie, seriously? Now, why do they say that? Why does Jamie Dimon call it a fraud? And yet he has a massive team working on it. Why do they say that? Because 46% of Berkshire Hathaway is financial services. 100% of JP Morgan is financial services. They do not want to be disrupted. They are Western Union saying the telephone is not useful. Right? They are the television company saying streaming will never happen. They are the horseless carriage, uh, the uh, horseless carriage companies passing a law in New York State that when the, I'm sorry, the, the horse and buggy companies passed a law through bribery to pass what's called the red flag law. You guys heard about red flag, you heard the term red flag. It comes from this law that if you bought a horse's carriage, you had to hire a human to walk in front with a red flag so the horses could see you. Anyone ever seen that? No, because it was stupid. And it didn't stop the disruption. So this actually is the most important slide you'll see all day. So gold is money. It's the only money in the world. 
Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. For 5,000 years, a single ounce of gold bought a fine person's suit. From Cleopatra's time to a suit of armor to a zoot suit in the 20s to Savile Row today. You take an ounce, you give it to someone, they'll give you a fine person's suit. Now, until 1971, money was money good. In 1971, we went off the gold standard and went to the fiat, where we could print money out of thin air, back with debt. Because it's not money, it's currency. Gold sits at the base layer in central banks, and then they issue debt to make currency, what we all use as money. Well, fiat money is going down. Any remember the lowest price for gas? Mine's 33 cents. Totem Lake, 33 cents, 1979, right before I left. Okay, 33 cents. Just filled up my car, $4.99. It's the same gas. Does the same thing. The gas didn't get better, the money got worse. Theoretically, your houses all went up in value. Did your houses grow? Did they get more efficient? No, they actually wore out. You had to put money into them to keep them the same. The money got worse. The money got worse. So crypto will ultimately replace. But no, Mark, crypto, look, it's a bubble. It went to $100, and then it crashed. And then it went to $1,000, and it crashed. See, it's a bubble. It's been declared dead 432 times. Rest in peace, Bitcoin.com. Go there and check it out. 400 plus times been declared dead. It's not dead. It's not a scam. In fact, it's 1997. This is like investing in Google in 1996. We're 11% penetration of crypto the same way we were with the internet in 1997. And this is a Metcalf's Law curve. The original line in red was done in 2014. Basically said the price would be $10,000 per unit of the network. In 2017, that exactly happened. Then it got a little exuberant, and the orange line does a little better math with what's called a decay factor because there is some lost or stolen. But everything is about these S curves. If you haven't read Harry Dent's book, The Great Boom Ahead, read it and understand S curves. Everything happens in S curves. The Bitcoin network, which is the most powerful computing network in the world, it's 1,400 times more powerful than the CERN supercomputer. It is a computing network. That's all it is. And what it does, it secures the most important network in the world. Anyone ever had to get a new Visa number because of fraud, you know, got hacked? Yeah, happens all the time. Why? Because Visa runs on a mainframe computer on COBOL. No. I'm not making this up. I was talking to the guy, I said, why? He said, well, it's too expensive to replace and it's kind of a moat because people don't know how to hack COBOL <laughs> very often. <laughs> but the problem is when it breaks, he said, we got to put a light on at the Sunnyvale Retirement Home and get some 80-year-old to come fix it. <laughs> and he's not joking because my 85-year-old dad can still code COBOL and no one else can, all right? So, What's happening is the Bitcoin blockchain today is roughly equivalent to one of the FANG companies. It's worth about half a trillion dollars. Now, total crypto is about 1.25 trillion. That's about a quarter the size of the global payments. And if you've ever made a payment using the traditional system, right? You ever try to transfer money on a, on a weekend or after hours? It doesn't, doesn't work very well because the banking system isn't open. But global payments should be 24-7, because why is American time the only good time? What about other times around the world? So gold is money. Bitcoin's better than gold. Why? Because it's more portable. All the gold in the world fits in two rooms about this big. OK? All the Bitcoin in the world fits on my phone. I don't have all on my phone. I don't have any, because I've been SIM swapped twice. By the way, phone companies, fix that, please. I mean, please, please. I mean, this is crazy. And it wasn't this company, but this other company that was shouting their name is AT&T. The first time it happened to me, they're like, well, someone came in, had engineered your ID, and came in, and, and we gave him a chip in, in Atlanta. I said, how about this? How about you put in my file that no one can get a new SIM card unless they come to this location in Chapel Hill, North Carolina? Oh, we can't do that, sir. I'm like, well, why not? Because we can't do that. Well, what could you do? Oh, we give you a passcode, an extra special passcode, eight digits. OK, let's do that. Second time it happens to me, I'm like, well, well, how did it happen? Oh, it looks like the passcode is overridden. I'm like, oh, so you're saying you were complicit. I did not say that. Pretty much you were complicit. So they were complicit. Anyway, so this is something called stock to flow ratio. If you think about gold, the reason gold is so important is because it's scarce. The amount of gold that's lost or stolen every year is roughly equivalent to what's produced. So it has a stock to flow ratio that's very high. Bitcoin just surpassed that last year and eventually will replace gold. So the little dots are Bitcoin. 
the silver dot is silver, the white dot is diamonds, the yellow dot is gold, and the red dot is real estate. So as a store of value, Bitcoin is more efficient. It's more portable, more, div more divisible. So 1971, oh, the new printer finally arrived. 2000, people can't save. Their money's losing value. Tell them to spend it then, OK? 2020, we're in a crisis. Nobody has any savings. Just print some more and send it to them. Remember, they sent you all a check? OK, 2021, inflation is high. Tell them it's transitory. All right, 2030, hello. Look outside, they're all there. Now, if you listen to the media, Bitcoin is the perfect storm, right? The ship's going down. If you look at reality, it's the greatest migration of talent I've ever seen in my life. And 2000 was big. The best, smartest people were going into the internet. Today, the smartest people in the world are going to blockchain technology. So, uh, exponential age, balance sheet printing. 10 trillion, half the money that's ever existed in the history of our republic was printed in 18 months, from 2020 to 2021. 100, 247 years of the republic, 245 years, half the money, two years, half the money. Why, what do you think happened to the value of the currency? It went down by 50%. So the price of stuff went up. The price of stuff didn't go up. There's no inflation. All this talk about it, there's no inflation. There's currency devaluation. When you get in debt, all empires have the same problem. They get far in debt, okay? And when you have lots of debt, you got four things you can do. You can pay it back, no way. You can tax all the wealth of all the people in the country. You can not pay back the debt. You can restructure it. No, someone have to take the other side. Nobody was gonna take the other side. You can default on it. Mm -mm -mm. Then, you get elect then you get sent out of office, and the politicians aren't gonna go for that unless you're in Argentina uh, or uh, Venezuela where you can just be a dictator. Maybe we have that here. Um, and then, or you can devalue it. And that's what all empires do. Anyone know why you have ridges on the edge of your quarter? Clipping, Clipping right? Because the Romans, right, in order to debauch their currency, would literally clip the sides and steal your money. So they put ridges on the side so you could tell if it had been clipped. So here's the thing. Everyone thinks stocks are doing so great. Stocks are awesome. No, they're not. It's because we quote stocks. CNBC talks about stocks denominated in toilet paper in the US dollar. If we price stocks in gold, which is money, they're dead flat since 1997. Just let that sink in for a second. There's been no growth in the equity market. It's all an illusion of debt. It's money illusion. Inflation is the crab grass in your savings. When I was growing up, I could go to the store in the 70s, okay, and you could get a cartload for 20 bucks. My wife asked me to stop at the store the other day to get one thing. Now I can't do that because I got to buy some impulse stuff. So I bought you know, a few nectarines, a few plums, and her one can of, of uh, tomato sauce. I went check out. It was $20. Like $20 for six pieces of fruit? Are you kidding me? $20. Okay, it was good fruit, but it wasn't that good. So here's the thing, from 1776 to 1913, a dollar was worth a dollar. You know why it's called a dollar, by the way? Because we stole it from the Rothschilds. It was called the Rijksdollar in Netherlands. Think about it, the, the Netherlands used to be the most powerful country in the world and had the world reserve currency. It's like the size of Iowa, right? And it was the most powerful currency in the world. Why? Because the Rothschilds, invented the first central bank, and they financed a bunch of wars. Well, we borrowed their central bank in 1913, and since 1913, a dollar is now worth two cents. So inflation is robbing you. So in 2010, millionaire, Lambo and mansion, Bitcoiner, homeless. By 2020, million dollars doesn't buy you as much. Look at Vancouver real estate. All right, by 2030, you got a million bucks, you got a shack, the Bitcoiners got the Lambo. By 2040, they say. So this year, this is this year, real time, best performing asset, again, 11 out of the last 14 years, best performing asset in the world. If you look out, zoom out, three years, okay? We printed all that money, the money got worse, Bitcoin got better, Bitcoin didn't get better, one Bitcoin's one Bitcoin, but we don't price it in Bitcoin, we price it in dollars, or yen, or euros. There's never been a bear market in Bitcoin in Venezuela because they turned the uh, boulevard into toilet paper. So 10 years, it's not close. This is big returns in the stock market. I mean, it barely looks perceptible, okay? Those are big returns in the stock market over the last 10 years, but nothing because we've been devaluing the currency. So what do you gotta do? You gotta diversify your portfolio. We've all learned that, Markowitz was right. Why do you want Bitcoin in your portfolio? 
because it's uncorrelated with the other things. Stocks and bonds are correlated because they're driven by the same thing, corporate profits, economic growth, interest rates. Crypto is driven by millennial growth, 83 million millennials. They're not going to own stocks and bonds. They're going to own crypto. The network growth, regulatory developments, technology. Okay, if you took 2%, put it in Bitcoin five years ago, instead of making uh, 11%, you made 13, 200 basis points a year better. That's better. This is my favorite, Amazon. You guys heard of that little company? This company, Amazon? Anyone buy it on the IPO 26 years ago and hold it today? No, no one did. Okay, why? Because it got 80% volatility. It has the same volatility as Bitcoin. The exact same volatility. In fact, Amazon's been a public company for 26 years. It's had a double-digit drawdown every single year, including this year. Average, 31%. On average, every year, you lose a third of your money. So who bought it at the IPO and held it to today? There's only five people in the world. Jeff, mom, dad, ex-wife, and Bill Miller. That's it. The rest were scared off by the volatility. Bitcoin has the same volatility, but instead of compounding at 40%, it compounds at close to 100. 100 is better than 40. Just is. So you can do the ostrich thing. The ostrich sees the lion come out of the bush, turns around, lays its head down, pretends that the lion can't see him. It actually doesn't bury his head. It's a wives' tale. Pretends the lion can't see him. The lion still eats the ostrich. The ostrich just doesn't see it happen. So you can ignore it. All right, beyond Bitcoin, let's get metaverse. So uh, Bitcoin is TCP IP of money. It's the base layer. Bitcoin feels like the internet before the browser. Blockchain, the tech, Bitcoin manifestation. DeFi, decentralized finance, is an apocalyptic event for traditional finance. NFT tokens, people are ready and willing to work, for crypt with, work with cryptocurrency. But the metaverse is the next chapter for the internet. He's already abandoned that. Now it's going to be Met AI because uh, he you know, never met a, a, a fat. He's as bad as, e, as Elon, right? Never met a fat he didn't like. So a year ago, we said that's so meta. We saw Bitcoin would have a tough year. We thought the metaverse would be a big thing. Snow Crash, great book, um, basically coined the term metaverse. We've heard of seeing The Matrix or Ready Player One. Mark renamed the company. Last year, everybody was all about the metaverse. Everybody's about the metaverse. What is the metaverse? The metaverse is where your physical life and your digital life collide. It's that intersection of interoperability, real-world connection, and immersion. And why does it matter? It matters because it is the future. Ultimately, we have the infrastructure, places like this that produce 5G. Then we're going to have the human interface, whether it's glasses or goggles or whatever. Ultimately, it's about decentralization, spatial computing, the creator economy, moving from creators producing data that the Web2 companies own and profit from, we can actually own what we produce. And so you got four things, virtualization, democratization, decentralization, identity, all of that converges into the metaverse. I love this. This guy, he already lives in the metaverse. Okay, my son plays a lot, when he doesn't play Fortnite anymore because he plays Valorant, but this guy, 14 hours and 54 minutes in one day. Okay, Travis Scott, some of you guys know who that is. I didn't really know who that was. He had a concert. So he's this famous DJ. He had a concert in the Fortnite Town Square. Two million people went to that concert simultaneously. Just think about the power of that. It's incredible. NFTs, you probably heard of them. I hate the term non-fungible token. What does that mean? It means unique item. And, and, and people think it's a token. They think it's some thing that you pull out of your pants. No, a non-fungible token is simply a digital property right. If you think of it as digital property rights, and if you think of anything that can be titled in the world will eventually be a token, all of it. It's not monkey JPEGs. I mean, it is that, but it will be war, far more than monkey JPEGs. So anyone name these artists? This is $170 million of art right there in three images. The one on the left, $91 million. The one in the middle, $59 million. Beeple, probably heard of them. Okay, I hate his stuff. I mean. And there's no accounting for taste, but I think it's hideously ugly. But I respect what he did there. I know with, for a fact that I have not brushed my teeth every day for the last 13 years. The dude made a piece of art every single day for 13 years and put it into a single image. That's awesome. That will be worth a billion dollars someday. Easy. Now, Fidenza on the right, I don't really get because I can turn on an AI and make it spin around just like anybody else. And, but Pac, Beeple, and Tyler Hobbs, they are making lots and lots of money with art. Bored Apes, you probably heard of them. $5 billion project from nothing. Went from nothing to $5 billion of value, $1 billion of the apes themselves, and $4 billion of the intellectual property around it. CryptoPunks, 
$2 billion market cap at their peak, the individual really rare ones, the zombies and the invisibles uh, and the aliens sell for millions of dollars for a single JPEG. Pretty amazing. I like the on-chain monkeys. Those are mine on the right-hand side. Uh, pretty good stuff. Um, DeFi, DeFi, decentralized finance. It is where all of financial, all the financial services will eventually be decentralized and it has to do with smart contracts, cryptocurrency. Here's the thing, I, oh, I do have it. So I have a six month old granddaughter. She will never have one of these. She will never have a leather wallet. She will never use paper money, not ever. She is a Gen A, a Zoomer, right? And that generation will never know anything except digital assets. That's all they'll know. History DeFi, it's been going a long time. I used to say it was the first inning. The players just entered the stadium. They're warming up. They haven't even sung the national anthem. We're talking 0.4% of bank assets. All of it will transfer from banks into DeFi over time. Ethereum uh, is it, uh, where most of this will happen. Uh, it, in, in my world, it's Bitcoin at the king. Ethereum's the crown prince. Then there's all the other princes that hate each other, like Saudi politics. So decentralized exchanges, uh, look, they, they, this one exchange here, Uniswap, does more volume than Coinbase. Coinbase is an amazing company, I love it. We're investors, made a lot of money. But this is gonna be where all of it eventually ends up in DeFi. Community governance um, uh, and social tokens, another one. Now some tried to play the metaverse in the traditional markets. They tried playing meta, didn't really work. They tried Roblox, that didn't work because they were overvalued. Um, you might have heard this guy on the left. He's a, a big deal where I live in North Carolina, or some people know the guy on the right. I don't know who that is, actually. Uh, I do, because uh, my 12-year-old knows him. But actually, it's not true. My 12-year-old likes different music. He actually likes electronic dance music. My 34-year-old daughter, all she listens to is rap. I don't get that. I don't get it at all. But creators, communities, and platforms all embracing social tokens for their audience. The real value is that you have access Okay, you have direct access to your clients instead of the music label. Make, like I just went and saw Journey, which was awesome, 50th anniversary tour. The two people, okay, Neil Sean, Jonathan Cain, hate each other. I mean, hate each other, like are suing each other. They had to get on stage together because they're out of money, because the record label took all their money, so they had to tour. But they hate each other. But that's because they didn't have a direct relationship with their fans. And, Existing companies engage or be disrupted. There's no choice. Talk to Jonathan here at, at NIFMINT about that. The major brands are getting it. You know, the NFT, I just got a, a text this morning from Starbucks about their new NFT launch. Gets sold out in seconds. Smart, they're doing it in a good way. If you're not into the metaverse as a traditional brand, you will be left behind. Um, Ultimate ordinals is a big deal. The highest value assets will eventually migrate to the strongest chain, that's, that's blockchain, so look into ordinals. Um, these are the Asprey eggs that are gonna get launched. Uh, 3D uh, NFTs, they're gonna be amazing. So in winter, that's when you want to invest. When everybody's getting laid off and everything's going bad, that's when you want to invest. I'll have to tell the story. In 1993, there's a big recession. There's something called Bell Labs. Some of you might you know, remember it before AT&T. And this guy got laid off. He said, can I take my project with me? We don't have any idea what dense wave multiplexing is. Knock yourself out. So he took his project, and he went around Silicon Valley, and no one would back him. Because they're like, we don't get it. You're going to take light and shine it through a prism and break it into colors, and you're going to increase the capacity of fiber optic cables? No. His third grade teacher retired, gave him 300 grand, her life savings. Bad financial decision, but it turned out all right. Turned into, again, 300 million bucks, like my friend here. And it turned out it was a big company called Sienna, and it did work. So now you can get 128 times the capacity out of fiber optic by shining it light through a prism, pretty cool. So crypto winter, we just had it, we went down 84%, people were bad, people were worried. All these companies were formed back in 2018, crypto winter. Some of these are multi-billion dollar companies and some will be much bigger than that. The current crop that just got formed, these are all things we're investing in today, companies like Gemini, Solana, uh, et cetera. Uh, if you care, uh, we have podcasts. This is uh, Danny Yang, uh, who's the founder of Metagood, who does the on-chain monkeys and is doing that ordinals protocol. Uh, this is an amazing interview. The only one better than this is the one we did with Pascal, who's the head of Ledger. That's the best interview I've ever done. I've interviewed a lot of people. Um, it's just amazing. We do an around the world thing. That's there. We do something about long short equity. That's my stuff. I've talked too long. Oh, I have to show you that. I have to show you this because 
For every engineer that we graduate in the United States, China graduates 45. I'm, no, no, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, no. For every engineer we graduate, they graduate nine. For every lawyer that they graduate, we graduate 45. Because they're a country of wealth creation, we're a country of wealth redistribution. You guys have been great. I will let you get back to it, and thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Chuck, 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 chuck. Thank you so much, Mark. Sure. Thank you. Sorry to go long. Oh, no, you're good. Bring the heat. Oh, that's not seven. That's in a different capital. That's the wrong way. Chuck, Chuck. All right, cool. So uh, we are going to break for like three minutes. So don't go far. We're going to get set up for the uh, next panel. It's Enterprise Blockchain in 2030. We have some really great speakers. Chris, Jeff, Jeff, and Max, Microsoft Providence Chain and Salesforce, and Chris from MetaJuice. So if you need a refreshment, uh, quickly grab one. We're going to grab our chairs and be right up.
try it. Like, check, check, one, two, three. Hey, hey, hola. Check, check, one, two, three. Can I have you back in your seats? I still see some uh, swag that was not picked up. You know, there's lots of valuable limited edition T-Mobile wholesale swag. So if you missed out in the first set of seating, this is your chance to come up and grab limited edition T-Mobile wholesale swag. Limited edition is the keyword here. All right. We're gonna kick off with this panel. We're running a little bit behind schedule because I just was enthralled with Mark Yusko speaking, so thank you, Mark. He just entranced me, I'm sorry. Um, so we're gonna catch up. Each panel will now be 40 minutes long. We're gonna do 10 minute breaks because I know everyone needs those bio breaks and to get the wiggles out. So, we're gonna kick off with the Enterprise Blockchain in 2030. The moderator will be the esteemed Chris Jones, AKA Jonesy. And he will be joined by Jeff Kramer from Microsoft, Jeff Gauss from Provenance Chain, and Max Camparetto from Salesforce. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ari, appreciate it. Since we are running behind, we're gonna jump in. I'm gonna ask each of you guys to give us a brief introduction, who you are, your organization, and if you can tell us a little bit about when your company first embraced blockchain technology. Cool, I'll kick us off. Hey everybody, uh, I'm Max Camparetto. I work for Salesforce. Um, I am based in New York. I've been with Salesforce for five years now. Uh, I've been working in block space uh, for two years officially uh, in uh, personal interest in crypto and blockchain since 2017. Um, Salesforce started uh, working on blockchain technology or products uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, first run. Uh, that got shut down, so no innovation without failure and learning. So uh, that was our first intro. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and get into it more later, but turn it over to you, Jeff. Good afternoon, I'm Jeff Gauss. I'm the, the co-founder and the CEO of the Provenance Chain Network. We deliver trust through commercial transparency. We exist for three reasons, national security, environmental sustainability, consumer protection. And uh, I first got interested in blockchain in the 2016 timeframe. My company got started to build a blockchain, actually a distributed ledger solution. And so that's, we've been at it from the very beginning. Hey everybody, Jeff Kramer. I'm the technical advisor to the CTO at Microsoft with a focus in Web3 payments and a variety of other things. Um, so uh, before Microsoft, I've only been there about 10 months. Um, before Microsoft, I actually had a uh, startup called Transparent Systems and we built a digital dollar within the US market. So real time, um, end to end on, on transfer of unlimited amounts of money 24 seven, 365. Um, as a dollar. Um, and uh, I've been interested in blockchain for a really long time. Uh, Microsoft itself has been involved in blockchain since at least 2017. I'm actually was put off a little bit. I tried to think about the exact time frame for Microsoft. Um, but uh, yeah, so excited to be here. Listen. Great. What I'd like to do is really dive into some of the uh, how you guys look at blockchain technology from a strategic perspective in terms of how it improves the lives of people, how it improves business processes. So if you can tell me a little bit about, you know, how do your organization's products benefit real people and benefit organizations? Yeah, so as far as what we've developed, I'll start there just so people have like some context for what we built. Um, in 2017, when I mentioned like we started working on blockchain technology, 2018, we brought a commercial product to market. The product didn't necessarily launch beyond pilot. So like, you know, the pilot started and stopped somewhat abruptly. The idea of that product was essentially, let's provide brands that are Salesforce customers with a means of using Salesforce to develop uh, permissioned networks and invite other parties into these permission networks 
uh, configure the settings and accessibility uh, and governance uh, criteria or parameters of that permission network. So you invite another um, member of a supply chain, for example, into that network and you say, these are the delegated rights and permissions of this party in the network. So they have this level of visibility and access to read uh, content or, or data from this network or from this blockchain. Uh, they can take these actions. They can create these types of assets or um, you know, data points in the network uh, and share data seamlessly between those different members of supply chain, for example. So it made it very easy to access information across different parties in a network. Uh, so people could seamlessly exchange data and information that they needed to conduct business and like operate with more efficiency. So I would say it was like an efficiency gain um, and um, kind of like a system for controlling who gets to see and do what. And, and to go a little bit deeper on that, so you mentioned the first effort didn't succeed. Why didn't it succeed? Digging deep here. Uh, no, I'm kidding. I, I wasn't involved. Um, so. Um, I, I think we were talking about this backstage, actually. So it's like very challenging to go to market with a product that is like people derive value from that's different than how people are incentivized to sell it. So like there is somewhat of a misalignment between our go-to-market strategy and the way that value was derived or realized from leveraging the technology. So you had uh, salespeople at Salesforce who primarily were concerned with and incentivized by selling a product to a single party. But they were looking to sell a solution that had multiple parties being invited into a network. Those other parties that weren't necessarily belonging to an individual seller or account executive at the company. So it was like a little bit of a riff between those incentive models. Um, and then too, like people were concerned with sharing data at the time across companies. Uh, so there were those challenges as well, yeah. Makes sense. Jeff. So I think we tend to look at things a little bit differently because I don't believe Web 3.0, Web 3 is an industry, it's purely a technology. And I've been involved in you know, the introduction of computer telephony integration and mobile computing and cloud computing. And I've never met anybody that wants to go out and buy this technology. What they're interested in is they buy the solution. The way that I, you know, the way that the metaphor that I use for that is I'm a weekend warrior, uh, carpenter, et cetera. When I go to Home Depot, I'm not going to Home Depot to buy a drill. And I'm not even going to buy a hole in the wall. What I'm buying is the picture hanging on the wall. And so the way we approached it when we came to market, or when we first started, is we had, we envisioned this woman, we, this persona we call our Conscious Kim. And so Conscious Kim is in her late 20s, early 30s. She's at early stages of household formation. She's educated by global standards, she's affluent. So she's in a retail environment and she's interacting with products. And so what we envisioned was those products revealing themselves to her based on her values. Now what's actually going on there is her digital twin is interacting with the digital twin of the product and there's a smart contract data exchange there. Well, to be able to do that, you gotta go get all of this data from the supply chain. And so we focused on an atomic particle which was a sales order, purchase order transaction, which is completely recursive the entire way through the commerce chain. So if you could figure out how to capture the right data from that, then you can use permission sets to say who gets to see what. So one of the things that people con are concerned about with transparency, especially when they talk about quote unquote the blockchain, which there is no such thing, is all of my data is gonna be available to everybody. Well, no it's not, because transparency is credentials plus vantage point. So that's how we look at it. Interesting, and I'm gonna come back. I got a bunch of questions there, sure. but I'm gonna let Jeff Kramer. Can you tell us just a little bit about how Microsoft approaches Web3 and because it operates in so many, you know, across so many sectors, how does that impact the products across multiple sectors over at Microsoft? Certainly, yeah. So I'll be clear that I, uh, I'm gonna talk for myself and not for Microsoft as a whole. Um, so yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Microsoft, um, you know, we, we had a very well publicized effort to bring um, nodes 
to the market um, early in uh, blockchain evolution or like early-ish. Um, and we shut that all down. Um, and we've been working in a much more tactical way with uh, third parties, enabling them on Azure. So that's a big push for us. And uh, we've signed a bunch of deals with different companies in order to make that happen. Um, and then the other side of it is particularly focused on customer and use scenarios. So there's a big push, and, and you can see it when some of the things we've discussed and announced, right? So we have a carbon accounting blockchain system that we've, um, we've pushed out into the world, um, which is getting a lot of traction. We also have um, a system called One Token, which is supply chain, um, kind of cradle to grave to um, tracking for uh, goods and services across the board. Um, and uh, particularly useful for companies building and distributing hardware um, and you know, is being used both internally and externally to Microsoft. And so there's this idea that like, there are, um, the, the, the idea is that you, you have digital transformation, and so you have a bunch of companies that have more or less wholly moved over from paperwork into digital systems. If that's the case, then why are we emailing each other PDFs of invoices and then hoping somebody updates my database to match your database? And so there's this idea that we, if we had a universal way of interacting with each other, then this would be far easier for us to be able to um, make these updates happen. No, that, that makes sense. So I'm going to come back to you, Jeff. So, you know, I think back to 2017, 2018. Uh, I was a Dragon Chain at the time. We were early trying to figure out, you know, enterprise use cases, you know, for permission blockchains, what we're all talking about up here. Uh, and at the time, remember, a lot of the infrastructure that was necessary in order to be able to effectively implement it within the enterprise space just wasn't there yet. You know, wallets, my goodness, you know, like how have you been able to address that, you know, now and, and how do you make it easy for people to be able to step in and adopt? So, you know, it's the Wayne Gretzky thing. You don't develop for what's available today. You develop for what's going to be available in the future. And so there were quite a few things that the technology wasn't quite there for when we were starting. But we just went and focused on specific use cases, and you know the, the, we've been fortunate in that uh, we've uh, we have picked up a, quite a few contracts from uh, the DoD. So the United States Space Force is our largest customer, and what, what we do for them is anytime they launch a spy satellite. So this is the National Security Space Launch Directorate. Before they launch that before they launch that rocket, they run down the pedigree of every single component on the rocket. And we're not just talking about the component, but it is also who was working on that and where was it being worked on. So we, we do the digitization of the people, places, and the products, and then the interactions between those three are what create the transactions that give you what is known as provenance, because there's a very big difference between traceability, transparency, and provenance. Huge difference. And I'm, I'm just going to, sorry, let me riff here, but I assume can you also then, in this system, have visibility into like who's certified to work on these parts? Were they the certified individuals, the ones that service these individual components, all of that, full, full tracking and history? Yeah, we believe what's being created now, if you go back to Jeffrey Moore's system of record, system of engagement, systems of uh, signals, and we believe there's now this fourth computing system called systems of evidence. And so one of the things about the evidence is uh, it's all about claims. People make all kinds of claims, and there's this law that I just read, Hitchens' Law, that anything they be, that can be claimed on the internet without evidence can be refuted on the internet without evidence. And so you have to have evidence to back up any claim that you make. So the provenance chain is all about a system of evidence, which is here's the claim that's being made, and here's the evidence that supports that claim. Let the buyer or the person who's interacting choose whether or not that meets their requirements. Actually, I, that dovetails into the discussion around AI. I personally am a believer that uh, the AI, acceleration of AI is going to actually accelerate the need for things like NFTs, you know. Take a simple use case, like eventually we're all showing our license to the police officer on our phone, right? Well, now with AI, you can quickly, you know, recreate someone's insurance card or license, right? So how are you going to authenticate that that is real? Uh, how do you guys see NFTs impacting what you guys are doing on the enterprise side? Yeah, so this is like our next uh, part of our strategy. So when we stopped pursuing that uh, original strategy in 2018, 
the team kind of dispersed into different parts of the company, got back together, reconvened around a new idea, which was a new way to employ NFT technology. Uh, so our platform now is a no-code uh, smart contract development tool. So you drag and drop, essentially, kind of like a website builder, but you um, kind of provide certain inputs into fields in Salesforce, which essentially write directly to a smart contract template on the back end. So you can very easily interact with a Salesforce user interface. You can create a smart contract. You can deploy that contract from directly inside of Salesforce with a couple clicks, right? So that's the new strategy that Salesforce is pursuing. It, can, can you give us a, uh, a simple case study, how someone might use that in practice? Sure, so like relevant to what your uh, kind of original context for this question was, you might eventually uh, leverage NFTs to represent uh, elements of uh, something that is a part of someone's identity. Like it could be, you know, not necessarily personal information that's being deployed in like to a public blockchain, but per perhaps to a permission blockchain or to, to pri private blockchain. So the California uh, DMV just started issuing or is starting to experiment with issuing um, car titles uh, on chain. And then there's verified credentials that can potentially be supported by this te technology, right? So these are the types of things that eventually people will realize that you can use this technology for, but Jeff and I were talking in, you know, behind the stage, you don't, you can create technology and you can put it out into the world, but people won't always use it, you know, exactly as you intended for it to be used. Um, so, you know, you have to be a steward of use cases and applications, but the technology can support verified credentials, identity solutions, um, and use cases as everything to collectibles. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear you yeah, guys. Yeah, so Microsoft does a lot with identity. Dip so your foot into Verified the credentials <laughs> and uh, identities in general is a big deal for Microsoft. And so we, we have a whole team working on verified credentials um, and bringing that to market. There's a product called Intra that does a lot of that work. Um, and uh, I agree with a lot of what you said. In fact, a lot of the research that's happening right now at Microsoft Research around um, identity pertains to like soulbound tokens um, and the idea that you could um, use soulbound tokens to define not only who you are but who you share them with and that um, plurality of identities is actually the thing that makes up who you are because you don't necessarily want to share with the DMV like your uh, Fortnite record um, and you don't necessarily want your Fortnite buddies to know what your bank account is so um, so there's this idea of like progressive privacy and how do you define portions of your identity that you reveal at any point in time to anyone or any entity or machine. Yeah, but we, we, it's like we're can I respond to the NFT thing for a moment? Because I, I want to correct something that was said here yesterday and that was, uh, and this is coming from the pride of being an Oregonian, there was a lot of talk about NFTs yesterday and who's the largest seller of NFTs. And what I was very surprised by was I didn't hear the word Nike mentioned because Nike is the single largest seller of NFTs for money. They, last year they did nearly 200 million in revenue off NFTs, which is 3.2x the next five players involved. So, and we, I was in the room when they created the Crypto Kicks, and so we we grew out of that whole initiative. So everything that sits underneath the PCN is all about NFTs, but they're not gonna to be tradable tokens. They're gonna to be tokens that are gonna be used on the network that, to create value and disclose information and things like that. Fascinating, you know, I'm in the game space now and you know, we look at uh, both NFTs uh, within our game as well as uh, decentralized identity and we think, okay, we're a 3D based avatar game and as people move between metaverses, they're gonna to wanna to bring pieces of themselves with them. <laughs> they're not gonna to wanna to have to create and build up a new profile every time they move to a different uh, platform, you know, within the metaverse. And so uh, we definitely see applicability there and I see both gaming folks and enterprise folks trying to kind of figure out how that's gonna work from a user perspective. How do you guys see uh, NFTs as it relates to provenance? Is that something that, is there an intersection there with what you guys are doing? And, and if so, what's that look like? Uh, so the simple answer is absolutely, and where I would take that is, you know, when I talked about Conscious Kim interacting with the product, it's her digital twin interacting with the digital twin of the product. And so uh, one of the things that, you know, is coming up, which is the, the sunset by 2027 
of the 2D barcode. We're headed into it, so this is the GS1 standard. So, and why I use that as an example, is if you go to any retail environment in, in North America and take any consumer product and pass it across a point of sale terminal, it will behave exactly the same way. That does not exist in the industrial manufacturing sector. Just take a look at a pallet of goods. There's all kinds of different barcode labels on it and nobody, nobody talks to each other. And so in the enterprise space where you're talking about this, you used to sell to one enterprise, but in the blockchain world, you gotta sell to multiple, it's a team sport. And invariably you have this, well, this is my intellectual property. I'm not putting my data on your network. And so what this reminds me of is in the early 90s when we had IBM Token Ring, we had Apple Talk, we had Banyan Vines, we had 3Com, we had Ethernet, and then along came this technology TCP IP, which bridged all that. And it was an inferior technology to some of those other designs, but it was most common, and it was very simple and easy to use, and it's now the dominant transport technology. That is the exact same thing that is needed in the industrial sector is a, te a technology that bridges all those different blockchains and solutions, et cetera. And we're stepping forward saying this thing that we built for the Space Force, the commercial trust protocol, if you're all American citizens, thank you because you paid for it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna park that at an entity, nonprofit, let it go open source to tie in with these regional technology innovation hubs that Secretary Gina Raimondo is calling for in the Chips and Science Act. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, and then we'll just be one of the competitors that is delivering against that standard. So it's the reason that we can call from AT&T to T-Mobile is because there's technology standards in place. That's what's missing here right now. Yeah, standards, we've been talking about those for a long time now. Uh, unfortunately, I have to go into this area. Just this week, Coinbase CEO said, we might have to bounce from the U.S. The regulatory environment is, is definitely challenging. I know in the gaming sector, we're launching a new token right now. Um, how does the regulatory environment impact you guys, your ability to innovate, your ability to not just innovate, but then implement the things that you, that you come up with? And, I, and I'm definitely interested in hearing, because you guys all have really differing perspectives. I'm interested in hearing from all three of you on this. I mean, you go ahead. Okay, yeah, so I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so Microsoft is, of course, heavily involved in um, uh, regulatory space. Uh, and generally, uh, we don't take a position on regulation within the U.S. Our, uh, um, and for myself, I mean, I think the, the idea that we need common sense regulation that can protect consumers is correct, but what we have right now is not working. Um, if you look at the enterprise space, though, I would say um, perhaps the hotter take is that for a lot of these applications, the thing you're looking for is not a chain that would be regulated in the same way as like a chain that you would issue tokens on or NFTs to like a public chain. That regulation there is really private contracts and private contract law and not the um, kind of SEC or OCC level regulation. Please, Max. So, so the way that it's influenced, uh, I'll just talk about how it's influenced our development um, and like guidance that we offer uh, to brands, customers of ours. Um, so I mean like, as far as what we've created, there was all types of ideas thrown out originally. It's, hey, could we enable brands to create loyalty tokens that are like fungible tokens that they use in loyalty rewards networks, et cetera, that are private or shared networks, all these things. These ideas were thrown out. Those got kiboshed because, you know, like those could be speculated on. They could be, depending on how the market treats things, you're subject to penalties based on how people treat things, even if it wasn't the intent when you were creating the assets or creating the technology itself. Uh, so we had to consider that. There's other things like uh, different token standards on public networks, like um, ERC721 tokens or NFTs are unique in some sense, even if they can be made to be less unique than some others or than they should be. Um, at least each has an ID, kind of like a serial number that uh, differentiates it from the next. Uh, 1155 tokens 
are less distinguishable from the next, one from the other. Uh, so they can be, in a lot of ways, treated like securities. So like we had to avoid enabling the creation of certain types of tokens uh, on our platform. This was an example of like how unclear policy and like treatment of assets and like how things will be acted on by external parties influenced the way that we decided to design the solution that we brought to market. So in our case, uh, you know, whether it's regulations or governance, I'll use those somewhat interchangeably. Uh, that's actually a friend of the PCN, and here's why. Uh, if, if you go back to the sales order, purchase order, what we've discovered is in this platform environment, every commercial transaction on the planet has at least one third-party observer. And in many cases, there's more observers to the transaction than our participants. And so that, those observers demand to know certain information. They're called regulators, so it's the FDA, it's the FTC, that they want to know what's going on in that transaction. And so we're a system of evidence. So the evidence that the consumer sees is a different set of evidence than the regulator sees because of the vantage point and their credentials. And so the more that the government can clearly articulate, this is what we need to know, that's our friend. And so in the case of the industrial sector, there's a whole bunch of NIST standards, 800-171, 800-161, 800-53, 800-38, 800 that say if you're doing this, this stuff, whether it be semiconductors and microelectronics, you have to have this disclosure. And the acid test of that is that the big one that you know, somebody was asking yesterday, is NFTs or blockchain important to the enterprise space? If you're in the clothing and apparel space, absa F and Lutely, because there were 3,500 cases of the uh, Customs and Border Patrol intercepting shipments that are coming into the United States for apparel goods. 458 of those were denied. 1,700 are in process for the uh, uh, Forced Labor Protection Act. What's that all about? Chinese forced labor. And you have to prove to the federal government that you don't have that in your product. It's very difficult to prove a negative. What you can do is you can say, well, here's the evidence I have that it's not that. And so, that, so the regulations, short summary, help us if they're clearly defined. Yeah, trying to prove something post hoc, particularly for supply chain, incredibly difficult. Incredibly difficult. And so you just get hung up. Wonderful. Now I'm happy to move off of regulation. <laughs> um, I'm really curious to know what innovations excite you? What's coming down the pike near term, you know, 12 to 24 months? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so, uh, Microsoft's heavily involved in cryptography as well, so zero-knowledge proofs, zero-knowledge EVMs, other zero-knowledge systems, very important to us, not only within the blockchain space, but also outside of blockchain. Maybe if you can explain zero-knowledge systems in case some folks don't. Certainly, yeah, uh, so I'll try to keep it at a normal level. Um, if you think about zero-knowledge systems, it's more or less a way to prove something is true without revealing what that thing actually is. And so the canonical example is you can uh, be asked to show your driver's license or you can be asked whether or not you're 21 or over. And so a zero knowledge proof would allow you to say, um, I'm going to show you a proof that says I'm over 21, but I don't actually have to show you my driver's license or reveal my birth date to you. And we can both be assured that it's correct. And so that's probably the easiest way to describe it, but the, the extent of it is pretty broad. You can imagine any amount of decision making or proof sets that can be built within these systems. Um, and that has applicability well outside of uh, blockchain. Mine's a combination of technology and other things. The thing that excites me the most about the next five to 10 years is uh, wildly pervasive 5G everywhere all the time. That number one, so connectivity. Uh, the second thing is I'm very excited about the population dynamics of North America in comparison with much of the rest of the world. It has to do with how our economy is going to perform over time. And then I'm really excited about the intersection of artificial intelligence and natural language processing because you know, the whole conscious Kim in that retail environment, she's going to have a computational device of some form. Could be a smartphone. Maybe these could be an earpiece in, and she's communicating, and she's having an Iron Woman experience of 
the, the, uh, the interaction of the products revealing good or bad for you based on her values. Well, there's a whole lot that has to go on in there, but that's a little bit more than two years away, but it's a lot fewer than 10. Uh, I, I'm going to repeat a little bit. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, but I, I mean, like privacy solutions to me are what I'm most excited about. I think they've been like a big inhibitor for um, general public being able to leverage public blockchain networks and infrastructure. Um, and they've been part of the driver or motivator for enterprises to adopt permissioned strategies, uh, or at least in part. There's plenty of reasons, but that's definitely one of them. Um, and uh, Ari provided an, an example yesterday that I thought was really cool, uh, that similar to what Jeff was talking about, the example of the driver's license and can you or can you not consume or buy alcohol or go into a bar. But Ari uh, told yesterday, for those that weren't here, a story of like going to a bar, sharing her driver's license with the bouncer. And when you do that, they can see much more than the fact that you're 21 or older. They can see your home address and they can show up at your home. Um, when you don't want them to. Uh, so things like zero knowledge proofs and just being able to validate that you meet a certain you know, threshold or criteria or whatever it is are super important uh, for those reasons, for like individual safety and privacy. Uh, so super excited about that. And then to what you were saying, the intersection of uh, AI technology, being able to generate things uh, and then authenticate that they have originated from a human even when they're are actors on a network that are not human. Uh, that is super fascinating to me and I think is gonna be like very important uh, focus in tech, especially enterprise tech in the next two years. Can I pick up on one word? He said you mentioned the word privacy and you talked about regulations. Uh, at the PCN, when we started out at the very beginning, we, we were doing some work in the legislature in Oregon about privacy. You know, Brigitte, who's here, was working with me on that. And this whole concept of self-sovereign identity is a lightning rod for a couple of trade associations that should be taking a completely different position than they are. The ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation are fighting it. And it's really citizen-centric identity, and we don't believe in data privacy. We believe in data property ownership rights. And if, you know, so that I'm looking forward to legislation along those lines, which all it's gonna really require is, and I, you know, I think it could come from the state of Texas, because property rights in the United States are states' rights, they're not federal rights. And all you need is a governor of a pretty progressive state to sign a bill saying we are declaring data as property, and then you have all the state law, tort law, to enforce that. So watch for that. That's an, that's an interesting one. So we, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, before I get to the last question, I want to ask you guys. So obviously, of all, or not all of us, you probably don't have kids doing too much on social media yet. I do. Uh, you know, when you know, mobile phone and social media came around, we thought, oh, this is wonderful. Um, there are downsides to the technology. Um, we see it, any of us who have teenagers and, you know, <laughs> dealing with some of the challenges they deal with, uh, we've seen that. How do you think about building solutions that address or make sure that we don't have the downside consequences of technology and innovation that we've seen come previously? Yeah, I think this is pretty far afield. I would say the, <laughs> I would say the when I when I think about the downsides of technology, you have a situation where you know, every computer science engineer that goes to college or any engineer at all goes through ethics courses and they try to establish like an ethical boundary around the work that you do. And I would say that we have unintended consequences and so we need critique to be able to point out the places where we can do better and then we also need to execute against not only the critique but also the future. And so I think the balance there is actually really tough. And we, we've seen that struggle, um, you know, in this new AI moment that we're going through. And how do you balance um, building the future with protecting people? And I think that's a really hard and important question. And part of the stuff that you're talking about, like data as a property right, is an example of um, one of the ways that we could solve that problem. 
you know, I think it comes down to, you know, it's, what you're really drilling into is ethics, morals, and values. And so, you know, um, I, I got taught a lesson one time by the uh, chairman of Johnson & Johnson. I was in a meeting where somebody said something about, yeah, that, you know, that's, the, that's the values of the company. They don't mean that much to me. And this guy put his hand on his arm and said, stop right there. And he pulled up the J&J &J credo. And if you, I know one of the guys in the audience here used to work at J&J. &J. And every single decision that that corporation makes is based on that credo, which is the values of that corporation. And I think that that's, you know, as corporations get bigger, they get further away from their founding values. And I think those values need to be revisited. And the whole data property ownership thing is in the top five of the values of, of our organization. That will never be violated. Yeah, I mean, like, people are building with boundaries, I think, is, is like, one way to do it. Uh, ethics are, and, like, a code of ethics or a credo is a boundary. It's a reminder of a boundary that you have. Uh, we have this exercise at Salesforce that Mark Benioff coined, uh, the V2 Moms, vision, values, methods, obstacles, and measures. So every year, top of the year, end of the previous year, you go through an exercise with your team, you kind of reset as a group on what your vision is, like what your charter is, um, what values you're going to carry forward with, and how you're going to adhere to them in the methods of what you're trying to do to accomplish that vision. Um, so this is like our strategy, and it's like a reminding exercise for what we do in development. Um, but at the same time, to your point, sometimes things that you build have unintended consequences, and like you just have to be able to react to that and do so with your values in mind as you do. Wonderful. And I'll finish up with this. Our previous speaker talked about uh, the inflection point. You know, inflection point is happening right now, particularly as it relates to blockchain. Uh, take 20 seconds. 10 years from now, what are we all going to be doing that right now we're, we're, we're all going, gosh, I have no idea how we're going to get there. What, what are we going to be doing in 10 years? How are we going to be acting, behaving, or what product might be out there that, uh, that we're using every day and blockchain is behind it and we haven't even, we don't even think about it anymore, like TCP IP. <laughs> I would say the, one of the biggest breakthroughs will really be around agentic, like working with agents. So we have agents that will be part of our lives and they'll interface with the things that we know and the things that we own and the things that we can get access to in order to be able to present us what we want. And uh, yeah. And I would, you know, I, similarly, I, I believe that the big thing that will happen in the next 10 years is cobotics, which is human machine partnership to solve specific tasks. And that will get better and better and better. And so you'll be able to have, you know, an assistant literally that can go act on your behalf with authority. So. Yeah, I'm just excited for a day where I don't sit at a laptop all day, uh, to be honest, uh, like, which is what they're getting at. Days like today. Yeah, yeah. And, and luckily yesterday, thank you, T-Mobile. Uh, so your avatar's in the Zoom while you're up here, right? <laughs> yeah, or even like to, there's like this old video of a guy serving himself coffee. It's like he recorded himself. Uh, like with a background filter on a Zoom meeting where he del deliver him himself <laughs> coffee. Uh, but yeah, like being able to uh, not be tied to uh, your machine in the way that you are today and being able to still benefit from interacting and leveraging your machine as an agent or whatever version of technology you're interacting with uh, to accomplish the same outcomes or be even more efficient. That's it, really. Wonderful. Max, Jeff, Jeff, thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Check, check, check. Thank you, guys. All right, we're going to take a quick 10-minute break. Um, thank you, Chris, Max, Jeff, and Jeff, for being our panelists today on Enterprise Blockchain in 2030. Our next panel will be on regenerative finance, refi perspectives. Uh, this is a last call for lunches, so if you didn't get lunch, uh, we're going to be taking those away very shortly. So right there in the back are refreshments and lunch boxes. If you didn't get lunch, please grab one now because they're going to be taken away and then we're going to be putting out more snacky items. So if you want like lunchy lunch, this is your last chance. Oops. This is going to be our next panel, so really, really looking forward to it.
And then there is a photo booth around the corner. So as you're shaking hands, making new friends, sharing hugs, also share a photo, a boomerang, uh, and tweet it out. Use hashtag Web3Unleashed. That's Web3Unleashed. And uh, please share it out. LinkedIn, Twitter, we would love the love. Don't forget to tag T-Mobile Wholesale. Um, and thank for th thanking them for uh, providing this wonderful venue and supporting this amazing event. All right, I'll see you in about nine minutes. Panelists for the refi panel, please go around to the back and get mic'd up. And we will be on in about eight minutes. Last call for lunches, photo booth, refi panelists, please get mic'd up.
for you now. When you come, I'll be here, waiting patiently now, baby. When you hurt, that him up. Come to me, let's change this, honey. Cause there's no reason not to. Check, check, one, two, three. All right, we're ready for our next panel. Dear friends, Web3, Metaverse, Blockchain, Bitcoin, Crypto, DeFi, ReFi community, please come back to the black chairs. We're gonna kick off the ReFi panel. ReFi stands for Regenerative Finance. And leading this panel, we have the esteemed Rex St. John, he'll be reading the uh, panel. He knows a ton about the space. He has a background working in NVIDIA, building ecosystems, super knowledgeable guy. Um, next, we'll have Will Lee from CeeLo joining us. We have a local celebrity, Paul Gamble from Nori. Jonathan Rakoff from the Hedera Foundation, also a local celebrity. And then straight off the plane from Germany is Marcus Frank from Mental Labs. Let's give them a warm welcome. Please give a nice round of applause. And please come back to your seats, thank you. And let's give them our full undivided attention. I think we have tons to learn about ReFi. It's a brand new space. Thank you. Um, as Ari said, my name is Rex St. John and I am the founder of ReFi Summit, which will happen at the end of next month here in Ballard. So last year we did ReFi Summit, which was uh, the first North America summit of size, and we had over 150 people fly into Ballard to join us there, including several of these projects here. And I'm also the co-founder of a company called Saga. So having said that, um, I would love to go across the room here and have each of you introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what your project is and uh, just start with Will. 
Hey everybody, um, glad to be here. My name is Will Lee. I work at the Cello Foundation where I head up uh, strategy and enterprise partnerships. Um, you guys heard about Cello yesterday, but just to recap, we're a mobile first EVM compatible blockchain with a strong emphasis on refi. Hi, I'm Paul Gamble. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of Nori, and we are a carbon removal marketplace. So we work with uh, farmers and um, ultimately other types of suppliers who are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and sequestering it. We put that through measurement and verification, and then we create certificates representing that carbon removed on chain, and then sell that to buyers looking to uh, remove their carbon emissions. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Rakoff. I, I don't think I've ever been described as a local celebrity before, so it's, it's, gonna, it's going to be a letdown, uh, no doubt. Um, I am the uh, head of global policy at the HBAR Foundation, which is the VC impact uh, investing arm uh, in the Hedera ecosystem, uh, and I work mostly on uh, similar uh, topics to, to Paul. Uh, we uh, are working on uh, Web3 tools that help to accelerate uh, natural asset marketplaces, uh, the voluntary carbon markets, as well as ESG, ESG disclosure uh, uh, by major corporates and others, um, a variety of other projects too that we might talk about. Hi, uh, my name is Markus. I work at Mento Labs. As you can see from the slide, I changed my hairstyle a bit. Um, <laughs> At, I worked for the last five years on Cello as well, and now at Mento Labs, I focus on using, for example, natural capital assets as collateral for stable assets or for other type of payment assets. So we look at all kinds of token economic solutions that could also incentivize the use of uh, different forms of natural capital assets. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, now, let's pretend that nobody in the audience has ever heard of refi uh, for a second. Uh, how do you define it? What, do you, what is refi? Somebody want to, Paul, what is regenerative finance? Refi is the concept that we can use blockchains and cryptocurrencies to align incentives to solve the biggest collective action problem we as our civilization are facing, which is how to solve climate change, how to, and not just climate change, it's kind of been extended to other areas of environmentalism and sustainability and that sort of thing, but it's, it's about aligning incentives so that we get pro-social outcomes uh, from this new financial infrastructure that we're using. From the Cello side, uh, can you define refi as it relates to Cello? What is Cello's interest in refi? Yeah, this is a really interesting question because I feel like it's such a new concept that everyone has a very slightly different definition of refi. Um, but just building on what Paul said, right, it's about aligning incentives. And you do that by, uh, in one way, putting a price on externalities, both positive and negative, so that like you're, um, you basically inextricably tie profit and impact together, right? And so um, maybe one way to explain it more tangibly is through an example, but we did this project with this uh, partner called Gainforced in the Philippines. Um, and basically they had worked with a bunch of communities where they owned mangrove forests. These like landowners had a bunch of mangrove forests. And mangroves are great for the environment. They, they do carbon sequestration, they prevent soil erosion, they're good for biodiversity. But uh, so it's great for the world, but the only way that these landowners can monetize from their ma mangroves is by cutting them down and selling them. Right, and so no one really wants to do that, but that's like you need to do what you need to do to survive. Um, so through this project, what they did was they trained these uh, landowners to measure mangroves and then tokenize it and put it on the blockchain. And so now companies can purchase these as carbon offsets. Um, so now you have a way to make more value out of a productive asset. Uh, so that's one example of refi, but we have many other projects in this space that are doing kind of cool things that weren't possible before Web3 existed. So my background is primarily in IoT. I was working at Intel, ARM, and NVIDIA before I joined Web3. So the key thing that he just said was you're taking something from the real world and converting it into a token. Uh, from the NVIDIA world, uh, we would call that a digital twin. It's like, here's my robot, and here's a representation of the robot, and these things are linked together by sensors and data. So what he's talking about is taking things like trees, water, carbon offsets, moving them and mirroring them to the blockchain via some ideally real-time linkage 
and that enables you to buy and sell and trade them and build DeFi instruments. So over the last couple of years, uh, there has been, I think, uh, a revolution in this topic, starting in the carbon offset market. So Paul, can you uh, talk about what has happened in carbon offsets when it comes to this? Yeah, the, so the carbon offset industry is um, deeply complicated and has been around for 15, 20 years or so, uh, going back to, well, originally uh, 1997 when the Kyoto Protocol was adopted. And so carbon offsets have been, um, for a long time, the domain of organizations that are called offset registries. And they're basically nonprofit bodies that are trying to certify different offset projects. But there's, um, there's not really a good uh, place of exchange for these offsets. And so what is quite common with some of these older uh, credits is a project developer will do something kind of like what Will was describing, and then will sell them to a broker who then might sell them on to another broker and another broker and another broker. And so you end up getting uh, these sold over the counter. Um, there's very little insight into the volumes of carbon that were uh, uh, transacted, who was buying them, what prices were paid. And it's very, very difficult to form any sort of market around that. And so if you are an end buyer, say a business that is trying to offset your carbon emissions or, or, or do something towards your sustainability goals, you don't really know how to seek out the types of projects that you might be looking for or how to price them. And so what we're able to do by putting this more and more of this stuff on chain is just bring this out into the open, make it much more transparent, and especially prove the provenance of who owns uh, what at what time and whether or not the carbon offset has been uh, retired, which is just language that we use in carbon markets to say that the end buyer has taken ownership of it. So it's, it's kind of like the basic proposition of what a blockchain and a digital ledger is for, is having a clear record of who did what, when, and at what price. On what you just said, uh, Rex, about linking real-world assets to digital assets, um, I would like to add or link this maybe back to the talk, to the great talk earlier by, by Mark today. Um, he said, one, um, everything that can be tokenized will be tokenized, so that includes natural capital assets, uh, for example. And then, two, we heard that in the area of traditional fiat money, we haven't seen a lot of innovation over the last 400 years, which then also means the value of fiat money actually went down. Um, and with this technology that we are here talking about with Web3, we now actually can add new features to money. We could add um, new incentives to money. Like Will said before, we could internalize previous externalities of uh, depleting resources um, in your business uh, into the incentive scheme. We could um, collateralize new forms of money with nature, and then more demand for this new form of money would lead to more demand of natural capital assets. And this is then a very strong incentive mechanism um, that, that creates more demand for clean air or forests or trees or carbon credits. So the Biden administration uh, passed an executive order which basically said, we want to treat the nation's natural capital assets as part of our GDP. And before we can do that, we actually need to catalog what they are. Uh, basically, uh, can somebody here explain what natural capital is and why they might be an extension of our GDP? Uh, so I guess I'll, I, I can take that. Um, I mean, I think it's, it, it's important to, to say from the outset that these terms are, are new and ill-defined and vague. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about refi, but as we were joking backstage, you know, when I first got into this space, I, I thought people were, you know, sort of suggesting maybe I should refinance my house. I mean, the, the, the terms are not always as precise as they need to be, and natural capital is one of those as well. Um, in the sort of environmental sustainability space, the traditional environmental law space, people think of natural capital as things like ecosystem services, like the, the value associated with uh, aspects of nature that are often uh, considered externalities or not not incorporated into the traditional financial system in the way that we might want them to be, but um, the way Paul, uh, you know, was um, we could talk for an hour just about the carbon markets, the carbon credits, and the offset. Uh, 
uh, offset market, you know, when at, uh, at the HBAR Foundation and Hedera, we, so we're an impact VC uh, grant making org, and uh, so our, our, we're essentially partnering with, you know, investee partners to, to build tools uh, to do things in the refi space that we want to see done. And, uh, um, you know, those, uh, those tools are focusing on natural capital defined as carbon credits or uh, biodiversity credits, things like that, you know, assets that we are synthetically generating to reflect those aspects of nature. But I think when we're looking at the policy making space, uh, the Biden executive order is thinking more in terms of, uh, you know, a, a country's uh, sort of portfolio of natural assets, its forests, its waters, the ecosystem services associated with its natural spaces. So you might take a country like Costa Rica, which may not have a lot of manufacturing or high tech, but it is uh, the majority of the value of their GDP comes from tourism driven by their natural assets, the rainforest, the turtles, things like that. So that's kind of the direction of natural capital. Uh, and the idea is that cataloging it somehow is going to be the future um, and adding that to our GDP. Which, can I add, is like an enormously difficult challenge. Like, it, it's hard to even wrap your head around where to begin on that. And uh, carbon is, is probably like the first and really only ecosystem service that has gained any sort of traction because it's at least a much clearer uh, metric relative to climate goals and sustainability and so on. But how do you value uh, biodiversity uh, in a riparian region next to a large section of um, farmed croplands. Like that's that's really, really difficult and markets are the correct solution for that, but it's going to take probably a long time before that infrastructure is in place and it's gonna start um, bit by bit. But the people who are working in the refi space are working on all of these problems um, from scratch. I could add say something to that really quickly. So um, yeah, I think another aspect of refi that's important is making sure that wealth and value gets uh, directed to local communities. Right, and so I think we talked about the difficulties of you know uh, tokenizing natural capital, but there are a lot of benefits. I think that work is very, very important because then you can. There's 1.7 billion people out there that are unbanked or underbanked or don't have access to like financial tools. But imagine that if you could, they could, for instance, tokenize their trees and take a loan out uh, uh, using that capital. I think that would unlock a lot of benefits for for people around the world. We heard earlier that, as you said, 40% are unbanked. Uh, what does that mean from Cello's perspective? What is Cello doing to fix that? Yeah, so um, at the, the Cello community has this thesis that there's a huge underserved opportunity in emerging markets. And we've seen this play out multiple times. Like there are technologies like off-grid solar or mobile money that have leapfrogged in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia because you don't have the incumbent industries um, there's also a fast growing and very young population. And so the growth rate is very, very fast there, right? If you look at the top 10 countries, when it comes to crypto adoption, seven of them are in the global south. And so um, for us, we've taken a very mobile first approach and a very user centric approach to try to bring uh, more folks into the financial system because basically necessity is the, the mother of innovation, right? And in places like where there's not as much infrastructure or there are not that many tools or ways to send money to receive and store value, um, we believe that that's gonna be the place where innovation really thrives. So if you look at a country like maybe Argentina that has had 100, 200% year-over-year -year inflation and they're trying to establish a new currency between I think them and Brazil, I could be wrong. It's like uh, the idea is maybe they'll pick up a currency with their mobile phone instead and use that, uh, something like Celo. Yeah, that's uh, the hope. So Marcus, we haven't heard from you much. Uh, what is Mento Labs? And, and you, you spent a lot of time at Cello. Why did you set up Mento Labs? So in the end, Mento Labs is a spin-off from the Cello ecosystem that is still in the Cello uh, ecosystem that is focusing on digital asset solutions um, for, that are in the token economic space. So we are all token economists and think about economic solutions, for example, how to invent new forms of money. For example, as I mentioned before, nature capital-backed currencies. 
where the demand for this currency then also would drive demand for natural capital. You could use tokenized carbon credit, tokenized trees, tokenized clean air, clean water as a collateral for a new form um, of currency. Um, furthermore, in this like token economic space, um, as you said, um, tokenized carbon credit is the first asset that is thriving in this ecosystem because um, there is this asset class already um, existing, also because um, the technology can add more transparency to this asset class, and therefore it's, it's, um, it's great that we see this in Web3. But there can actually also be new forms of carbon credits. For example, Move to Earn is an interesting, um, interesting example where you could incentivize um, people, and here we're working together with uh, Deutsche Telekom, you could incentivize your employees or your customers to move more sustainable, and uh, for moving more sustainable, you would get uh, tokens that could be a mini carbon credit, maybe a saved kilo of um, emi um, emissions um, when you move, when you walk or take a bike instead of taking um, your car. Um, and here, as Mentor Labs, we, we help in the end with the token economics. This is always a part that gets very tricky to get the economic part of the token right, that we actually capture the value in the token in a transparent, um, a transparent way. Um, and also where we help, for example, companies to combine different tokens that incentivize different sustainable behaviors. You could combine, or maybe you want to incentivize your employees not only to move sustainable, but also maybe to, uh, to eat sustainable or to save energy, and you could combine these different behaviors uh, in, a, in a token. What do you think uh, is the future of ReFi starting from right now? What does the next 10 years look like? I think we're just at the start of this. Um, we just saw a first few projects going into that direction. We see that this technology is extremely beneficial because it adds um, new new capital for, for certain types of assets. It, I, I think, also opens up new ways of, uh, of um, using or of giving natural uh, resources a value. And therefore, I think we are just at the start of this. I think that right now, in such early days of this, it's mostly just crypto natives, people who are familiar with DeFi tools and, and how to use um, on-chain tech, who are participating in this space. But over the next, um, even very, very soon, but over the, certainly over the next 10 years, I think we'll start to see a lot more larger enterprise adoption and integration with these things. It's, Speaking from the the carbon perspective, I mean the types the the types of buyers out there who would be want to be acquiring carbon removals and um, similar such things are companies and businesses, and also on the supply side, like as more and more companies see that there is financial opportunity here by removing carbon or preserving carbon, whatever the type of credit is, they're going to get into that space. I mean, at, at Nori, we actually are partnering with Bayer, um, the, the pharmaceutical company who also has a very large agricultural arm, and they are working with uh, farmers that they work with and selling carbon that's sequestered by those farmers through Nori's marketplace. So that's just a start, and I would expect to see much, much more uh, large-scale enterprise diving into this, into all of these different types of projects. Yeah, I think it's, uh, like everyone said, it's very, very early, and so we won't have any idea what it looks like in 10 years, but I think ReFi has a lot of tailwinds behind it, right? Um, like, there's all, 80% of companies around the world now have, like, or large companies around the world now have um, net zero goals at, by some point, right? The uh, regulatory landscape is changing and making it more and more um, challenging for companies to pollute without uh, any consequence. Um, and then on top of that, on the user experience side, I think, like, Web3 is becoming a lot more accessible. I think those things are combining to, to serve as like a perfect storm for this like refi disruption um, wave that's happening. So I guess I would just add that while um, 
we definitely are at an early stage with respect to refi. We also don't have a ton of time if we're focused on climate change. Every report from the um, IPCC says something more and more dire. Um, you know, uh, so I don't actually come from a crypto native space. I'm, I'm a you know 20 year DC lawyer. You know, uh, trained. Uh, environmental sustainability at my best uh, expert and you know I've been scrubbing into the sort of web3 uh, crypto space for the last couple of years and you know my, my sense is you know exactly what um, uh, what was just said you know the the demand side the folks that will be brought into the space they are corporate sustainability officers uh, ESG teams they are calculating their carbon impacts their carbon footprints uh, using for now, uh, mostly these uh, uh, estimate-based, uh, spend-based estimates that uh, are algorithmic, and so they're not they're not measuring from the ground up. But you know, more and more accuracy is being brought in, and uh, and they need or they're finding uh, people that I used to represent was I was when I was in private practice. Uh, major corporates are finding that they can't abate all of the emissions that their stakeholders demand that they abate. So they're forced to go to the market and at least for the time being, look for uh, things like carbon credits to offset those emissions. Well, here's the problem. Um, all the defici deficiencies in the carbon markets that Paul alluded to earlier have presented a headwind. Folks don't want to buy when there's this risk that uh, if you buy you know, uh, $10 million worth of forestry credits and then uh, it just, you know, it turns out that, uh, you know, those forests had actually burned down, you know, six weeks ago or they burned down six weeks from now. Uh, does that present greenwashing risk? Or is there an enforcement danger? Certainly there's an optics danger. And so, um, you know, uh, one of the ways that, that my team is tackling this interesting problem is uh, to view tokenizing uh, sort of environmental benefits. That's that's what a carbon credit is. We're tokenizing the benefit of one one credit, typically, is uh, one metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent removed or reduced from the atmosphere, right? But you can tokenize all kinds of different environmental benefits. And um, up till now, that mostly means creating this digital twin. So the carbon registries have, uh, you know, some at best web two, but also could just be a piece of paper in a drawer uh, signed by some witness saying that, uh, you know, there's a uh, environmental project that gives rise to that level of reduction or removal. What we're what we're trying to do with a company called Envision Blockchain is uh, to build. Uh, a tool that will, we call it the Guardian, that will uh, allow uh, tokens to be minted that reflect carbon credits with all of the interesting environmental attributes uh, of the underlying projects built in. It's, it's, it's actually not as, uh, you know, sexy as some of my colleagues imagined it is. It's, it's just, we're building in metadata, so you know, like when you buy a house, uh, that there isn't an encumbrance uh, you know, on that house, there's four bathrooms, not three, things like that. So we're building assets that are um, richer and more uh, uh, and more detailed, giving the uh, corporate buyers more confidence that what they're buying is actually something of value. What's a biodiversity credit, and how does crypto and refi fit with that? Uh, well, I think um, you know. Uh, there are some very smart people um, at places like Nature Finance that are trying to work out precisely what a biodiversity credit will mean. Uh, you know, the, uh, the agreement at COP15 in Montreal this past year uh, sort of catalyzed uh, for the first time, you know, some momentum towards building these markets. But I think at bottom uh, or at, you know, at a high altitude, uh, you are finding a way to monetize behaviors uh, that will increase uh, biodiversity or reduce biodiversity loss. So uh, we spent a good deal of time on the topic of carbon, but it seems to me like energy and crypto are uh, highly related. Like one of the biggest criticisms of Bitcoin, for example, is the energy footprint. And up until Ethereum switched over to proof of stake, it seemed like that was a, a critical uh, issue. Are you seeing interesting use cases of energy credits or energy offsets in the refi space? Sure, I can take that one. Um, so first off, not all blockchains are equal. Um, some blockchains like Bitcoin or others that use proof of work as a consensus mechanism will use a lot more energy. Um, Celo, for instance, is proof of stake. 
Um, we're also carbon negative, so built into the protocol, a portion of all gas fees um, is put toward offsetting carbon. So we're actually carbon negative. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of different cool use cases. Um, there's one actually that I really like, uh, this project called EcoBytes went, that went through the T-Mobile T-Challenge recently. Um, they will uh, pay you for switching from uh, net using your network to Wi-Fi, and that actually saves a carrier some money. Uh, so the carrier takes a portion of that savings and kind of pockets it, but then will pay a little bit in a token that you can then use for other things, like you know, getting discounts or uh, buying carbon credits or other sort of solutions. And so there's a lot of ways where you can kind of like have a win-win situation with Web3 tools where the, the user wins, the, the, uh, the implementer wins, and maybe the environment wins. Um, so one of the graphs that was circulating last year when Bitcoin was under pretty heavy criticism was the total uh, energy consumption of global data centers. And I'll try and recreate it. It was like Bitcoin consumes this much and energy data centers consume this much. Uh, with the explosion of AI, it seems like this much is going to be much higher. You need a lot of very heavy duty processing to train all these models. Uh, uh, when I was at NVIDIA, I, I'd begun studying uh, effectively what's now called deep in, which is decentralized physical infrastructure, things like Gridcoin, things like uh, Flux, where you're tokenizing compute cycles such as GPUs. Uh, do you see use cases in like uh, maybe dynamically offsetting some of that data center footprint? You know, we've talked to um, Bitcoin mining companies and data center operators and stuff like that, and they're actually not that interested in um, offsetting or something like that themselves because they see themselves as moving on to nuclear and renewable energy as the main solution, which is, you know, also correct. Um, but also in part because of the um, the sort of counter narrative that people in the Bitcoin community were developing around Bitcoin acting as a battery. And so when you have um, power generating facilities that are uh, producing power that isn't being consumed by its users, like in the middle of the night, uh, then that's just going to waste. But that could be directed towards mining Bitcoin, which has an economic value. And then that could be used for doing other things during the daytime. So. Um, uh, th that was a hypothesis that we had, and it turned out to actually not be correct. And even if Bitcoin, for example, would totally run on sustainable energy, we still wouldn't have solved the, the climate crisis. And I think here, this technology actually, as you said, um, gives us more tools to, to move toward a, a solution, including, uh, again, incentives. I'm an economist, so I always have to talk about incentives. But I think this is a very strong and powerful tool. We've mentioned this before. You can um, internalize uh, natural capital depletion into your economic system. You could with this technology set the right incentives for your clients, for your employees, for in the end everyone um, to behave more sustainable. And here we have now a much broader tool set with this um, technology um, than, than we had before. I think it's definitely important to pay attention to the energy consumption of the Bitcoin network. Um, I, I joined uh, the HBAR Foundation precisely because, among other reasons, the Hedera network was ultra low energy for uh, a variety of reasons and uh, carbon negative due to some investments that we've made. Um, but it, I think it's also important uh, for folks to have some perspective, you know, so at least back in uh, around about, I remember thinking summer of 2021, certainly the fall of 21, every other New York Times article seemed to suggest that, you know, um, Bitcoin energy consumption was the, you know, straw that breaks the camel's back of, you know, global climate action um, and all these comparisons to the energy consumption of small nations and so forth. But everything that we do in modern society has an energetic cost. And, uh, you know, you can also make comparisons to things like tumble dryer usage between, you know, month X and month Y in the continental United States, and it will exceed the energy consumption of the Bitcoin network. So, you know, perspective is important, but it's also important to, uh, you know, to move to renewable gens where you can. Have you seen any uh, really, really interesting refi use cases you'd like to share? Something you can point to that said, I didn't know that was possible. 
I shared a couple. There was the, the, the mangrove forest one. We talked about ecobytes. Um, but I think refi I, I, is broader than just the environment. At least my definition of refi is broader than the environment. And so I think things that are really, really interesting are like areas of exploration, like community currencies, for instance, right? Where local communities can have, uh, create their own currencies that are more locally responsive to like local economic needs. Um, could be an example of refi. I think there are aspects of DeFi or decentralized finance that could be considered refi. So we did a project with Mercy Corps about using DeFi tools to give loans to smallholder farmers and at uh, basically half the rates that were available in the market. I think that could be very, very like refi focused. And so I know the definitions are fuzzy, but um, there's just a lot that you can do with the tools, as Marcus said, um, about aligning incentives and making sure that value actually flows to um, communities around the world. And I think it sounds a bit like yeah, stories from the future, backing capital with natural capital uh, resources, backing currencies with it. But in the end, this is already possible. And they are already, for example, in the cello ecosystem, partly uh, nature capital backed currencies that are in, the use, globally, in use globally. And uh, therefore, I think uh, this is now moving much faster than, than ever, ever before. Where can people go to learn more about refi? Are there events? Like, where do you go? Oh, good question. <laughs> May 22nd in Ballard. Um, there are a lot of podcasts uh, that cover refi. I think there's one that's called the Refi Podcast. Um, uh, I think Kevin Awaki on Twitter is probably the best follow uh, for that. He just came out with a new book um, that I haven't read yet, but I don't know if you guys have seen, um, but it, it looks great uh, about that. Uh, he, might have been the one who coined the term, I'm not sure. The green pill, you mean? Or yeah, yeah, the pill. green pill stuff, um, uh, which is also a podcast th that he hosts. Um, yeah, that's what I would suggest, Twitter and podcasts. I, I mean, I, I, I would suggest definitely picking up a copy of the green pill book. When I got into the space, I um, read it cover to cover and thought it was a, a great introduction. But, you know, it's, it, it's also probably worth uh, reframing this question, um, you know, it's it's great if the public is more interested in refi, um, more knowledgeable about it. But you know, those of us on the stage and in the audience who have, um, uh, you know, our jobs or uh, our passions take us to the refi space, need to um, redirect some of that energy to educating our policymakers because right now what we um, you know, what we're seeing, rightly or wrongly, uh, a little bit of both, I think, is this uh, kind of intense regulatory focus on the, the ills of private crypto. Um, but not having been in DC for many years, you know, I can tell you that not everyone, um, you know, smart people of good intention, um, really have a uh, particularly good understanding of the difference between a meme, meme, a meme coin and, you know, a tokenized carbon credit, right? They're not the same. Uh, they're focused on different social problems, uh, different risk profiles, and, uh, you know, we all need to do our part uh, to bring education to the, uh, you know, the doorsteps of folks that um, are going to set the rules, um, you know, over the next five, ten years. Maybe to add one more source of information on the space, there's also Climate Collective. Um, they have a web page, climatecollective.org, which is also a coalition of different pro projects in the refi space, um, also investors in the refi space. Um, and this collective, in the end, also gives them a joint voice to the outside, to regulators, to the interested, uh, interested public um, to, to also yeah, strengthen this ecosystem. I second that. Climate Collective is excellent. Very cool. Uh, so one final thing. Um, one of the things that most attracted me to ReFi, and when I was at NVIDIA, I began following ReFi on Twitter. I started building a list of ReFi projects and I found myself adding five to 10 projects a week. And when I got to 300, I quit. And I was like, I don't know what's going on here, but it's just growing and growing and growing. The enthusiasm for it is incredibly strong. And when I go to crypto events, you know, like Cosmoverse and Medellin or uh, ETH Denver, the refi area tends to be one among the most active. And when I see things like that, like it made me th think a lot about something that Peter Thiel said, which is, he likes to find a trend where a lot of people will work on it for free as an investor. And I think Bitcoin had that, and cryptocurrencies had that, and Ethereum had that. And it felt like uh, in, in, in some way there's something going on in ReFi from a cultural perspective that's kind of like uh, taking this culture forward. Have you seen that yourself? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's piggybacking off of a lot of interesting trends, right? There's a wave of sustainability-minded folks who are very 
uh, people who care about the environment. There's this wave of like innovation that's happening in Web3 and blockchain. Um, but I mean, I can speak personally. I the reason why I joined, I, I wasn't in Web3 before I joined Celo. I come from an international development and finance background. But I came because I was really passionate about using really cool technology to solve big problems around the world. I think what's cool about Refi is now you have the tools. Uh, in place, you have a lot of cool people and you have really big problems. Um, and it's kind of fun to think about like what these tools could enable. How could you change incentives and align incentives in a way that drives impact? But not just impact, but there's also uh, profit opportunities here too, right? And so I think that like the constellation of different features attracts a lot of really smart people. Uh, I echo that sentiment. I had talked to a lady, her name is Anna Stone. She's the founder of a project called Good Dollar. And they built out a universal basic income prototype where they've got 500,000 people in their network and they're able to uh, send them funding and give them loans and things like that. And uh, I, I think that sort of innovation is, is coming out of refi right now. And there's a lot of projects that are uh, breaking a lot of new ground. Um, so I think um, we're on time. And thanks again to everybody here. Uh, and we've got a refi summit coming in Seattle in May. I'm going to be, I've got a bunch of cards if you want to come to refi summit. Kevin Awaki is the keynote speaker. Thanks for mentioning. Paul's going to be there. Uh, I think we're going to have Cello. We're going to have Hedera. Uh, Marcus, I don't think you're going to be there. You should come. <laughs> <laughs> so check out refisummit.org and uh, really appreciate any final comments. No, thank you. Uh, for those who are going to be in consensus in Austin next week, we also have a refi house. Uh, feel free to talk to me if you are interested. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rex. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, uh, Paul, Jonathan and Paul. <laughs> All right, we have a little break again. Um, and we have the next panel coming up. It'll be, whoops, Web3 and gaming. Um, this will be a really, really interesting talk. If you haven't heard about um, any of the projects that Justin, Calvin, or Rahul are working on, this is going to be really, really exciting. Um, just mind blowing stuff. So uh, make sure you uh, get your refreshments, bio breaks. Take a, you know, oh, what is that thing called? You know, the little fast video that you do, you can sit in front of the uh, camera instead of taking a normal camera photo, you can sit there and do like this. It's a boomerang, do a boomerang photo and uh, share it. Use hashtag Web3 Unleashed, hashtag Web3 Unleashed, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, love, share the love. And uh, next up, is the Web3 and Gaming panel. We'll begin at about 3 o'clock sharp. Panelists for Web3 and Gaming, Justin Mu, Calvin Bonilla, and Rahul Sood, please head back to get mic'd up. Thank you.
Check, check, one, two, three. Guess what? It's that time. Web3 and gaming. Who doesn't love games? All right. This panel actually is gaming in Web3. We lead with gaming, right? All right, I need everyone to come back to the black chairs. We'll put a pause on the conversations, do the last fist pump, the very last hug, chest bump, whatever it takes. Put a pause on it. Come back to the black chairs. I need you. I want you right here with me, gaming and Web3. All right, I'm going to start reading their bios. Justin Wu is gonna be our moderator and he is amazing. Uh, Justin Wu is a growth marketer and information architect who shares daily content on social media on growth hacks, campaigns, and building communities. If you don't follow Justin Wu, follow him on Twitter. I think he has hundreds of thousands of followers. I mean, he's one of our like super influencers here in the Pacific Northwest. Follow him on LinkedIn, he's really good at that too. Wu has helped brands achieve over $3 million in Kickstarter, has launched a SaaS company with 100,000 MRR and over a million AR within the first year in the blockchain industry. Wu has served as growth and marketing lead for 15 blockchain companies and dApps on their campaigns. He's a popular content creator on Twitter with over 135,000 followers. Wu has appeared on the Wall Street Journal, CES, NASA, NASDAQ, and received sponsorship from Samsung, Intel, and New Balance. Please welcome Justin Wu. Woo! All right. Come on, everyone. I need you back hit the black chairs. Remember what I told you what it feels like. If you're on Zoom and no one's there and all their videos, cameras are off, you're just talking. I can sing again. Remember I was singing this morning? You don't want me to sing again. Next up, we have Kelvin Bonilla. Despite working as a game developer for over 14 years, Kelvin has labored in a wide gamut of businesses, from indie game teams to AAA studios to startups and enterprise, international enterprises. He has cultivated transferable skills to contain, contribute in any domain. Today, he focuses on Web3, R&D, and internal services at Unity Technologies while his free time is spent kiteboarding during windy days and otherwise tinkering in Web3 hackathons. Please welcome Calvin Bonilla. Woo! And then another local celebrity and entrepreneur, Rahul Sood. He's the CEO and founder of Irreverent Labs. Uh, Irreverent Labs founders Rahul Sood and David Raskino join us to discuss <laughs> blockchain and AI in gaming. They are leaders behind Mecha Fight Club, the upcoming play-to-earn game where players train, fight, and breed fully autonomous, artificially intelligent NFT combatants in the metaverse's most ridiculous combat sport. They are uniquely positioned to dissect the current state and pro future promise of blockchain gaming, artificially intelligent NFTs, and the potential of simulated life on the blockchain. Please welcome Rahul Sood. Well, awesome. Thank, thank you again, uh, uh, Ari and, and many of oh, well, the microphones might be working. <laughs> Little technical difficulties. Well, while Raul uh, solves that out, um, this is probably one of my most favorite topics, uh, Web3 and gaming. You know, we think that gaming is always a big leader in mass adoption, innovation across the board, whether it comes to like cloud technology, user adoption and growth. And gaming has just been a constant growing theme uh, for NFTs and adoption. We're starting to see many big players come into the space. You know, Square Enix announced uh, of their big moves there. I actually just came back from Tokyo yesterday to take a look and talk to like the Sega, the Nexons, and even a lot of the Korean gaming uh, companies. All of them actually have started to look into uh, gaming very, very seriously as well. So uh, Web3 Gaming is kind of uh, bleeding into finding out how the metaverse may play is gaming and Web3 metaverse games all together might be relevant. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, same with NFTs as well. How do they play a role into the games uh, as well? But just like taking a look, stepping outside of Web3, uh, just recently on Counter-Strike, I think they just sold like the one gun, uh, a skin of a gun for $500,000. Actually, two of them, one for 500K, another one for 400K. So 
Uh, it just goes to show, even outside in the normal traditional gaming world, uh, there's big money um, being involved. Uh, people spending a lot on digital assets, games, game worlds, uh, and even skinning uh, some of the games as well. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, just, that's just kind of a quick intro about all the things that are happening. Um, you know, we also see like whether across the board from Microsoft, Sony, and others starting to patent some of the blockchain uh, patents uh, and technologies for like DRM and some other alternatives as well. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we have an amazing panel here kind of sharing uh, de their deep experience, um, not just in Web3 gaming, I think for me and my experience, uh, uh, hosting a lot of conferences and events uh, globally, you know, we see a lot of Web3 uh, gaming people uh, but they never actually actually created a real game before. Uh, they just hosted uh, maybe fundraised uh, things just for Web3 Gaming because they're first to market or maybe they write good smart contracts and whatnot. But to build a game and actually having game vet experience is a whole nother different skill set just even without Web3 applications alone. So um, I'm happy to like have this amazing panel of uh, people that actually have had uh, experience in the gaming world, more in the Web2 gaming world, uh, and bringing all that expertise into Web3 as well. So uh, let's go down the line. Kelvin, you want to do a short, quick intro of yourself? Uh, yeah, so hey, everyone. Uh, Kelvin here. I, I think the, the intro is pretty succinct. Uh, all I can add to that really is just kind of like, currently, you can find me today working at Unity Technologies. We're you know, exploring all the different types of technologies that empower creators to just, uh, we have a saying, the world is better with more creators in it, and we just try to create better technology so that everybody could be a part of that party. And in regards to Web3, that's kind of where you're going to find me, most of the pockets in Unity. We, we take a look at this. Uh, for those of you who, the way I'm going to put this is, we're all gamers here. Honestly, everyone in this audience is a gamer. It, it doesn't matter if you play Counter-Strike, if you play Candy Crush, or if you play the stock market. People play games. Games is part of life. And so the whole idea here is just kind of like finding ways that we can use this sort of technology, this movement that we're doing, and grabbing the good parts out of it. Because uh, at the end of the day, there's, there's good actors and bad actors. And that's kind of where you're gonna find me a lot of the times at Unity is just kind of like ana analyzing a lot of these uh, different tech stacks, seeing what fits into the panorama, seeing what is helpful and extracting those good positive outcomes out of the technology and making sure that when Unity is providing value, we're just doing it in a positive way that empowers everyone. So that's kind of where you're gonna uh, be able to hear a little bit about me today and, and what I'm talking about. Yeah, next row. Yeah, so uh, I'm Rahul Sood, and I'm a, a long time, I've spent all my career in gaming and entertainment, um, and I've, I've had sort of multiple companies in the space, um, including like a, a hardware gaming company that started many, many years ago. It was acquired by HP. Um, I was, uh, I, I moved to Seattle with my family to start Microsoft Ventures many years ago, so I was at Microsoft for four years. Um, and. Uh, and also, um, I, I was uh, deeply involved as an investor and uh, strategy, head of strategy for an AI, uh, sorry, an AR uh, um, headset manufacturer called Vervana that got acquired by Apple. And, uh, and then I started an eSports betting company that by accident became like the largest betting company for eSports and video games in the world, and it was built on blockchain. It got acquired in 2021 by a, a large gambling company out of London called Entain. And now, um, I'm the co-founder of Irreverent Labs, and Irreverent Labs is uh, a really crazy, interesting company where we sort of sit at the intersection of, um, of uh, entertainment and, uh, and uh, machine learning. And um, I started this company with my co-founder who I met at Microsoft. Um, he spent most of his career in machine learning. And uh, when, when he heard that um, my last company had sold, he, he reached out to me and asked what I was working on. And I told him really nothing. I, I, I honestly didn't feel like working uh, anymore after a lot of stress at, at Unicorn, my previous company, and just wanted to take a break. But we started riffing on ideas. And I was telling him about this really dumb idea I had for a video game. I, I would say it's probably the dumbest idea I've ever had. Um, it was uh, like this robotic cockfighting game based in the future in the year 2140, where these, uh, these uh, uh, cocks and hens fight in the coctagon. And they're, and they're meant to be NPCs, which are like non-player characters. And, um, and he loved the idea, like so much so that he quit this job, amazing job that he had at Microsoft to come in. And he really thought that we should, we should breathe life into these characters using AI. And so we're effectively, we're creating this game 
where, uh, where every character in the game is an artificially intelligent NPC, and, uh, and they all are individuals. Um, and then at the same time, we're using AI to help create, to generate game graphics. And we recently had a breakthrough where this, uh, this application that we're building allows you to take images, 2D images, and, uh, and it does video prediction. So you can do text to create 2D images, and then it does video prediction to create short films. It's, it's unbelievable. And uh, this is sort of like the, the AI revolution that we're dealing with. Um, anyways, long story short is, I mean, this is a fucking long story, but uh, the, the short story is that when we started this company in 21, uh, we quickly raised $45 million with uh, Andreessen Horowitz as our lead investor. Um, they really saw the future of AI. We, we had no idea that generative AI would go where it's gone. Um, we, we, we called it automated entertainment, and now it's really turned into generative AI, and that's, that's where we sit. Awesome, and uh, just a quick short intro of myself as well, Justin Wu, uh, co-founder of Decentral, uh, host uh, Web3 conferences globally. The uh, largest conference that we have is uh, Decentral Miami during Art Basel, about like 5,000 attendees for that one. I uh, also hosted the first NFT stage inside of E3 um, in 2019 when E3 was alive. It's dead, rest in peace. Um, but the, for this year, um, we're actually bringing in a full Web3 gaming expo um, into LA uh, in June. Uh, maybe we'll replace what E3 uh, couldn't do, because um, E3 actually banned Web3 when they were supposed to launch E3 this year. They wouldn't allow, allow any Web3 games inside there, but you go to GDC, is a whole different story. Um, but then we're also doing like the Tokyo Game Show version as well, so we're hosting a conference, a Web3 dedicated conference uh, during Tokyo Game Show as well for that counterpart. So my, my interest has always been moving forward with the games and metaverse space, and uh, I'm happy to have this panel here as well to explore uh, all those different different topics as well. So first question I have is um, kind of, you know, how can Web3 um, enhance gaming, you know, whether it be on the Unity side and also what you're building to at uh, Mecca Fight Club, but I guess with you, uh, Kelvin, um, with Unity, you know, you guys are empowering other developers as well. Uh, how does like Web3 fit into that stack with developers and does it enhance it, pull away from it? Is it a distraction or are you guys trying to abstract that Web3 like complexity for the video game developers. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna preface this with uh, most of my comments are gonna be a little spicy. I'm actually a hardcore gamer, like by heart, and I am the most orange-pilled hardcore gamer you will find. So uh, that's usually a, a very conflicting opinion if you go to GDC. Gamers and NFTs isn't quite a popular topic as it turns out. Um, so with that preface out of the way, uh, I think that's what kind of puts me in, in a privileged position at Unity where, where people are actually kind of, uh, they give me the opportunity to, to voice technical opinions and analyses on, on the things that Unity wants to approach for creators. Oftentimes, uh, someone once told me at Unity, uh, success comes from when you're in love with the problem and not the solution. And oftentimes we see that a lot of people come in trying to solve a problem with blockchain that could be solved with a traditional database. You know, there's, there's a time and place to use the right tool. And so uh, with Unity, that's, that's exactly where we focus on. It's like people come to us and say, we wanna make a blockchain game, we wanna make NFTs. And one of the first things we, in our engagement is, why? Why do you need the NFT? What, what function does it serve your game? How, how does it work? And oftentimes, it's, it's all about money, right? It's all about revenue. And again, that's where we go back and take a look at it and see like, well, is this, are you generating sustainable revenue with your NFT applications? And what are you using it for? Because I think one of, the, one of the things that a lot of people were seeing with their games is everybody mints an NFT. And something that happens in Web3 is that it's, it's supposed to be this vision of interoperability. It's this vision of being able to create assets that anybody can own. Well, what's the point of owning these assets if the game shuts down? What's the point of having a sovereign asset if the only place you can interface with it is in a single domain, the game where it originated from? So there's a whole lot more to Web3 that still needs to happen, and that's where Unity kind of steps in. We try to evaluate and make sure that our customers are set up for success with what they're approaching instead of just shooting themselves in the foot. So uh, when, when I think about Web3 and gaming, I, I look at it from the standpoint of a gamer. What, what do I care about? And, um, and 
I think it's all about ownership in the characters that are in the game, which is why we're creating these characters that are artificially intelligent. Imagine, if you will, you own a dog. How many of you have a dog or a pet? Okay, so if I offered you like $1,000 for your dog, what would you say to me? Like, you'd probably tell me to go to, oh yeah. <laughs> well, you'd offer me your dog, yeah. I would never sell my dog. I love my dog. He's like, uh, he's amazing. And, um, and when I think about a game, like this robotic cockfighting game based in the future, we're, we're imbuing all of these cocks and hens with their own personality. And think of it like a Tamagotchi. I don't know if you know what a Tamagotchi is, but back in the day they had these keychain uh, that, you'd, that you'd give your kids and they'd walk around and they'd, it's like a pet. Think of this like a futuristic Tamagotchi with the sense of humor of Family Guy or South Park and the fighting style of like Mortal Kombat or uh, Street Fighter. These characters are unique. They're all individuals. And people can, can buy and own those characters and they learn from them over time. There's no human interaction in terms of controlling the character with a joystick. They control themselves. But you don't know if you have like a psychopathic bird or if you have like a bird with high empathy until you actually watch them behave. The one thing for sure is when they see each other, they want to fight. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that type of like feeling that you get is the kind of feeling we wanted to create with, these, with, with uh, Web3. My issue with Web3 is in the US, we have a regulatory environment that's extremely unclear. And it's getting more and more challenging for entrepreneurs like myself to kind of exist here in this space because we don't know what's going to come next. And that's the biggest challenge. And, and, and I think that uh, in the US, unless they figure this out, they're going to push a lot of uh, innovation out of the country and they're going to help spawn more FTX type fiascos. So it's, it's a little frustrating. It's kind of a double edged sword, but it's very, very, very important that uh, people who are in gaming understand where the future of gaming is going, and that is like in the ownership and having, uh, you know, personal connections with the characters that you own, that type of thing. Yeah, I think that would be another topic we'll have to deep dive a little bit later, kind of like what's going on on the other fronts outside the U.S. as well. I mean, we're, we're seeing a lot of like government-backed uh, metaverse funds coming out of like Dubai, Saudi, uh, even China is going very heavy, and especially in Shanghai. Hong Kong did a full 180 turn on allowing crypto again, uh, opening back up in June. So the money inflow is moving very fast, really quick overnight um, back into those territories too. But we'll talk, talk about a little bit more about that and even also talking about like kind of East versus West uh, gamers as well too. Um, kind of looking at like the Web3 landscape um, with gaming um, is... Where are the ethical points uh, for Web3 to potentially have a good application? Is it through NFTs? Is it through tokenization? Uh, kind of love to hear from both of you guys' perspective, uh, or is it a combination of those, you know, first it was like play to earn, right? Axie Infinity um, kind of was like that digital Neopets, almost battler game slash Pokemon, um, but that wasn't sustainable, right? Um, that didn't, uh, people were playing a game just to earn money and after the liquidity dried up, that disappeared. So how does gaming look, or from your guys' perspective, Web3 gaming look from now on? Is play to earn dead, or is it gonna be evolved into a different version? Or uh, kind of what's your perspective on that? I guess I can go first. Yeah, so look, with, with play to earn, um, what we saw was a, a number of games coming out that were effectively creating mini Ponzi schemes, maybe not intentionally. But the problem is that they're emitting a token that, uh, into, an, into an economy in a game that requires user growth. And if user growth stagnates, the whole economy falls apart and everybody goes broke. That's a Ponzi scheme in a nutshell. And when we started uh, developing Mecha Fight Club, we said in order to build a sustainable economy, there has to be actual human output or, or work um, put into it. And you have to bring fiat into the system in order to reward people with something. You can't just emit a token out of thin air. The biggest problem with this space is you got a bunch of people creating random tokens and driving speculation, so it drives the wrong behavior. You have people that are uh, trading tokens, trying to pump the price. All they care about is how much money they make. They don't give a shit about the game. Excuse my language. It's, uh, it's horrible. So, um, you know, where, where it needs to change is people need to start thinking about how to build sustainable economies, um, how to build fun games, more importantly. And, and lastly, like, where does NFT fit in? Um, to me, NFT fits in not so much in interoperability. 
interoperability is like, I have a sword in one game and I'm going to take that sword to another game. Like, that's never going to happen. I play games, I'm not going to take Teemo from League of Legends and put him into Counter-Strike. I mean, that would never happen. But the idea that I can take that character and, and have that character as a pet that goes into different mini games is a pretty sick concept. So, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I love that you started from that angle because that's, that's a deep dive into one of the pillars of Web3 with a lot of like uh, the tokenomic incentives, the solid game theory, game theory in the sense of like incentivizing users to drive the expected uh, behavior from a rational actor. Um, I, I do want to take uh, this specific question and clarify something uh, that a lot of people seem to take for granted and that is the definition of Web3. I don't think anybody has a concise, agreed upon definition of what Web3 is. Neither do we have one about the metaverse. So until we get that, uh, really Web3, and anybody can kind of give a very generic answer and kind of get away with it. So one of the things that I tend to do when I, when I have this conversation and this topic is I, I like to derive my answers from the Web3 uh, perspective of uh, Gavin Wood, who's one of the uh, co-founders of Ethereum, who, who was using the word to talk more in the context of blockchain and cryptocurrencies, because that's kind of what our conference today is about. So in that, in that regard, you know, there's so much more to Web3 uh, for that, that is available for games other than just money. And I think that's the part where the games industry is currently hung up on. It's, it's this whole incentivizing with tokens and currencies, but if Web3 is treated as an umbrella, we have distributed identities. We have uh, community building systems, right? We have uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. We have all these different consensus protocols where we can have people pass referendums that can be agreed upon in majority and drive innovation or drive community behavior. If an entire 90% of players identified a remaining 10% of toxic players, they could actually provide the authority to just boot those players out of the game. Now, provided they just come in and register as someone else and continue causing chaos is a separate topic, but the idea that these tools are available for them, they're not being tapped into today in a mainstream level the way tokenization is. So there's so much more that Web3 has to offer in games that's not being tapped into, and that's kind of where, where it leaves us today. We're still in the beginning, and that's kind of the overarching theme today, right? A lot of the things that we're talking about, we're only getting started, and these are the reasons why. There's just so much more to explore, and making games is hard. Kind of a follow-up question to that is more like on the, let's say like the development standpoint, um, you know, with Unity side, you interface with a lot of developers and, and, and big publishers and, and games as well too. Um, and then also you with you, Raul, you're building your own game as well. Um, I guess what has been the challenges from developing a Web3 game from, your pers from a design perspective as well? Uh, has it been through the tokenomics uh, or is it just like even deciding like what the, Web3 stack looks like, right? What chain, what wallet you use, uh, the UX as well too. What, what are the challenges you guys see currently right now? And what do you, what do you think uh, that will look like to resolve some of those uh, issues so that we can get mass adoption as well? So given that we're building uh, a, a game that intersects with entertainment and AI, the, uh, one of our biggest challenges is compute, for example, getting access to GPUs, which we've been able to overcome getting uh, NVIDIA H100 GPUs and, and, and the cost of compute is very high. That's one thing. The second thing is like the talent, like machine learning talent, try and find top ML talent and tell them they're gonna be working on generating like how many, how many cocks and hens can you generate per hour kind of thing is kind of a weird ask, right? So, um, so, so where they get excited is in the idea that we're, we're actually uh, hallucinating videos from, um, from I images. Um, and, and, we're, and we're creating like a really, really, we just had a really crazy breakthrough with this product that, uh, that will allow anybody, you don't have to play the game, but it'll allow anybody to come to our site and, and create short films. And we're, and we're gonna announce this or launch it, not announce, it's already announced as of like right now, but we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna share it with the public in, uh, in like the July, August timeframe. Um, so, so that's sort of a challenge is like finding the talent. But the biggest challenge, honestly, the biggest challenge is, uh, um, is like the regulatory environment in the US. It's so confusing and, uh, and it's so frustrating because good entrepreneurs are, are, are in trouble right now. Like Coinbase, 
who 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 is uh, allowed to be listed on the on the stock exchange here in the U.S. is getting sued by the very regulatory body that allowed them to list on the stock exchange, the SEC, right? Coinbase is getting sued. Bittrex was one of the like the the bigger first founding exchanges in the world, based here in Bellevue. They had to shut down, um, and they're getting sued. Uh, Kraken is probably going to get sued. Like I don't know. Everyone's getting sued, and nobody wants to. Um, and so you know, so I think the challenge is sort of like the regulatory uh, environment for the space. Like not to like if anyone here at T-Mobile is looking at doing something with NFTs, that's fine. I have ideas that maybe won't get you in trouble. <laughs> But because, um, you know, there's big brands in this space as well doing really cool stuff. But when it comes to like these token economies and things like that, it gets really like it, it gets very worrisome. Yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, aside from like on top, I should say, of regulation issues, one of the things that we see at Unity a lot is just people don't really I, I kind of mentioned this earlier. People don't really appreciate the uh, the use of the technology, right? They just, they just want to use it because they're excited about it. And it is exciting technology. I love it. But at the same time, it, it's kind of like, I want to make an NFT game. It's like, great. And where do I start? I minted all these NFTs, and it's for a game, and the game isn't even built. It's like, it, shouldn't it be the other way around? Like, shouldn't, do you have the game idea first, and then maybe create something that's tokenized? And it, it seems that a lot of people just kind of like, Go for the money first because it makes sense. You got to fund your project and then figure out. Okay, well now I have to make the project. And then the the thing that we observe is that a lot of these people um, I, I have, have never built a game before in their lives, right? Yeah. Thank you. I, I I struggle to say it. Like I don't want to be that guy who's just criticizing, but I'm in the middle and watching game developers being like, I don't know how to do this crypto stuff, and then the crypto guys being like, I don't know how to do this game stuff, and I'm in the middle like, which one? Who do I help? I don't even know. I'm only one person. So. Uh, that that's, that's a really in, uh, interesting intersection that you're going to find today uh, in gaming, and it holds a lot of things back, right? Because you kind of, you don't really know what to build into the game, and then that plays really deeply with your tokenomics. I love what you said earlier about, like, taking an item from one game to another and how that's never going to happen. And it's, it's not that it's, like, technically infeasible. It's more like it's technically impractical, right? Like, you just completely unbalance one of the games for the sake of sovereignty of taking an asset and using it elsewhere, um, let alone the fact that you managed to wrangle two game teams in a complex project to not destroy their own internal economies while they receive a foreign asset that might completely unbalance the entire game. Like there's, there's just so much that is being overlooked. And, and so you need these two people at the table and, and be willing to work with each other. And I think so far, a lot of the crypto crowd is definitely willing to work with games but a lot of the people in games are still a little wary about like, oh, this, this looks like a casino cash grab. So getting these cultures to kind of mesh is a human problem. And I, I like what someone once said um, with blockchains and stuff. It's like, you can't solve trust with, uh, with technology or something like that. Um, and I think it's to some degree is true because a lot of the times we could call blockchains trust machines. I like to call them confidence machines. At the end of the day, you had to trust the programmer or you had to trust your own ability to read the code or you had to trust that the consensus protocol worked great. You, you reduce the trust to something, but you're trusting something. So it's just that it gives you confidence. And a lot of people, until they see it that way, they're, they're sort of walking in this murky ground of who do I trust, who do I work with, and how do we get together to build the next great thing? So it's a people problem that we're still trying to solve. Yeah, thanks for sharing both insights, uh, especially even like going to kind of the, that other layer above like the gamers, the developers, and even the publishers. I think everybody has different goals, right? Gamers want to play good games, maybe earn money or get more and more assets or value or get skins. Uh, the developers just want to develop the game, right? <laughs> and then the publishers just want to make a lot of money and extract a lot of money. I think that that's where like the biggest disconnect is uh, across the border there. But um, kind of taking another uh, look at it as well, um, how, how do you guys see like big brands like Nike and others like enter the space and how could they kind of get involved with uh, Web3 into like their offerings as well? Is it kind of more of a soft test mode, which I think we're starting to see like a lot of POCs, like little micro tests from McLaren to um, even Porsche and uh, even Gucci is just like sprinkling or doing a lot of collabs as well. How do you guys think is kind of like the best perspective from um, somebody with a, little, a ton of IP or a brand uh, without tarnishing that, you know, kind of enter Web3 um, in, the, in the space? 
Yeah, well, there's certain brands out there that uh, create a very desirable product that nobody can get. Um, um, and so, so, like, for example, Nike. Nike might have a shoe drop where they're, they're going to launch, like, the Tiffany Nike collab shoe, right? And, uh, and you're never going to get it, um, you know, unless you buy it off StockX for, like, five times the price or whatever. Um, and it's a $400 shoe, but you don't want to pay $2,000 for that shoe. But you want to get that shoe. And you want to be part of the crew that can buy that shoe at the drop. So what a company like Nike could do is they could create an, a membership-based NFT. It's, and it's a limited one. They could do like 1,000 of them or 2,000 of them. And they could offer it to their customers for like $5,000 for this NFT. Uh, but this NFT gives you automatic access to this like drop, right? Anytime a drop happens, you get to buy that drop. How many people do you think would sign up for that NFT? Like everybody would. Anybody who, so anybody who collects shoes or likes shoes would want to pay the five grand to get that NFT. And then they have that, like a membership to a stadium, like a seat in, uh, in like the new basketball you know, team that's coming up. You know, you got charter seats or whatever, and you can sell those seats anytime you want to someone else or that type of thing. That's interesting. The same thing goes for like brands like Rolex or like AP or Patek, like companies that sell watches where you want to get a watch, you can never get it. Uh, the only way to get it is, is like, you know, to, to just, it's just stupid. You got to pay too much money for a, like a third, uh, you know, a watch because, uh, because you want it that bad. Buy this membership. Or Porsche, what they should have done was they should have done the same thing. You can't buy a GT3, but if you have this NFT, you can buy a GT3. Like, that's the kind of thing that I think NFTs can do really well for, for, for brands. Another really interesting use case that I, I found with NFTs was what uh, StockX did. So StockX is a company um, that sells, uh, that, that like a lot of your kids know. And it's a place where, where you can go and buy shoes and like, and, and you know, off the secondary market or like the Omega Swatch Watch or whatever. You can buy these shoes off the secondary market and, and send them to your home. You're paying a little premium, but they also have a marketplace. So like people buy a ton of shoes and they sell them on StockX. Now, what they found was that people were like trading shoes, but the cost of shipping was super high. So what they did was they attached an NFT to all the different products as a digital, to as a digital token to say, you can sell that shoe to someone else and StockX will still hold it there, no shipping. And when somebody redeems the NFT, then the NFT disappears, and the shoe gets shipped to the person who buys it in the end, right? Who redeems it. Says, I want to wear that shoe. I don't want to just trade it. Really cool use, and there's a lot of cool ways that people can use this technology that, uh, that you know, few people have thought of, but uh, there's just so much opportunity to do it. Yeah, I would say that the, at, at the core of it all, an NFT is nothing more. Like, people like to use the acronym, and people like to, to just sort of, like, mythologize NFTs, and it's, it's really just an entitlement, you know? Like, it's, it's a coupon that lives in the cloud, and it, it, you can prove that you own that coupon, and that you can use it. Like, the, the real distinction between some entitlement that exists for decades now that we use in systems, and what we have now when we play around with an NFT is basically its availability. Well, an NFT is on a smart contract. That means it lives on a blockchain. A blockchain is a machine that can't really be shut down because there's millions of machines powering it at the same time. So it's always available, it's always there, it's never gonna be shut down, and it can always be verified. But if the person you're redeeming it from is guaranteeing that they're gonna stick around, if they're guaranteeing that they're gonna offer you the service, and under oath and under law, they're not gonna you know, go around and say, oh, you actually don't own a coupon anymore, what's the difference? Well, the difference is one you have to trust and the other one doesn't. And that's where it really comes into play. It's like, what are some things that are worth trusting? And what are some things that you're maybe not so comfortable trusting? I'm okay trusting a game developer that keeps track of my inventory in my massively multiplayer online world, but maybe I won't trust the government with my gold bar in times of war. So I'd like to own the gold bar in my hand, or in this case, Bitcoin. Um, so the idea behind NFTs is, is not necessarily novel in and of itself in, in its application, but it is novel in the sense, or more like it's greatly appreciated in the sense of its resiliency. Some things definitely must be resilient. Others, I think we can make those trade-offs to actually uh, engage in the benefits. How many people here have a cryptographic wallet, like a hardware cryptographic wallet? Raise your hand. 
So about half. I walk around everywhere I go with my cryptographic wallet and people look at me like I'm crazy. And so uh, some people do because we just have comfort in knowing that I have access to my funds wherever I go, everywhere I travel. But at the end of the day, like, d does it matter? Do I walk around with some sort of like USB key with my usernames and passwords for my games? No, no, not really. Right? Some people are okay using MetaMask, which is like a regular wallet, and people store their entire wallet contents in this digital application on their web browsers. Or they go to Coinbase, and they just hold their entire portfolio in Coinbase. It's kind of like you paid the tax of facility instead of owning the self-sovereign for certain reasons. You chose to trust for facility. And that's the same thing that comes here with NFTs and gaming. It's just some people are willing to make that trade-off, and we get a lot of benefits from making that trade-off. It's up to us to decide when we want to make the trade-off and when we want to reserve uh, our rights to just owning the whole thing. Yeah, so it seems like from the summary of that, um, was what, especially what you shared with our world, it's like brands could kind of provide kind of that exclusive value from the perks, the items, or things that they can have an offer from the brand as well uh, into the mix to create those experiences that are exclusive uh, and get adoption there. And it's funny that you, sh you shared that Nike story because Nike actually just launched dot swoosh or dot Nike uh, this week and they gave away actually 100,000, they call it OF1s, is like the original like Air Force Ones as well. Um, and that was raffle, so that means that there was probably a couple hundred thousand users instantly as well. So they didn't make it exclusive, but they forced people to get their wallet uh, to join the, the Nike thing. So <laughs> here's, yeah. a, here's actually an interesting idea. So years ago, um, I, I, I was on T-Mobile. Uh, my family was on T-Mobile. And, um, and I got simmed, uh, and, uh, and like my life was sort of turned upside down. Um, then I switched to Google Fi, which, as you know, is T-Mobile, but it's like an MVNO on T-Mobile that is sort of uh, a different security layer on it. Wouldn't it make sense to have like, a, like an NFT tied to, your, to like the, the SIM transfer portion of things, where if, if someone says, hey, I'm Rahul, and I just got a new phone on AT&T, and I want to transfer my phone there, like there should be some sort of like digital token or something release or whatever that's like the last line of defense so I don't have to wake up at 8 in the morning and find out that somebody stole my life at like 12 a.m. or whatever. That still happens today and it's kind of depressing. It still does. But um, the cool thing like Google Fi is actually tied to your Gmail so it's been a little bit more secure and I love the fact that it's built on T-Mobile. Um, but you know, anyways, I'm just saying like that's a good use case. Yeah, in, a, in a world where everybody would have uh, cryptographic wallets and would walk around uh, like crazy people like me, um, one of the things that I was talking to my colleagues about just recently was if you think of something like a bar, an adult-only bar, and you know a minor wants to go in, but we live in a world of where everybody owns their wallets, um, it could be that driver's licenses are issued as NFTs. At that point, all that really means is that your cryptographic wallet is tied to a specific identifier on, on the blockchain cloud. So a bouncer can just go to the miner who wants to get in and be like, all right, here, sign this cryptographic message. Prove to me that you own one of these driver licenses NFTs. So there's really only going to be two outcomes that are going to happen there. Either that cryptographic pass is going to succeed or fail. If it fails, we've just proven there's a miner trying to get in. The bar is no longer liable. They don't get into trouble or anything. If it succeeds, then there's two outcomes out of that as well. Either the miner turns out they're not actually a miner, or the miner stole someone else's uh, cryptographic wallet. So in either case, the bar itself is sort of partially or entirely, depending on your jurisdiction, absolved from liability. And this is a, just using NFTs and cryptographic wallets. But as you can see, there's dependencies in this. That means we need to live in a world where everybody has cryptographic wallets. So we're still trying to get there, right? Like there's a lot of novel cases for NFTs, but we need an NFT culture that has embraced it in order to be able to, to get there. And I guess it starts with monkey pictures. Yeah, like board apes and other JPEGs as well. Uh, but I guess on the topic of like cryptographic wallets, and you start diving into some of the Web3 deep uh, terms and, and jargon as well. But I guess like the everyday gamer and like the everyday user might not even even care about all that stuff, right? As well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and they might not ever ever, ever actually even care, right? So, uh, do you think that we're gonna go back? You know, I keep everybody. You go to all the conferences now, everybody keeps, they're now pulling back, they're trying to find a new marketable word, Web 2.5 now, right, yeah. <laughs> into the space. Like, we pulled back Web 3, we went to Web 5 with Jack Dorsey, and then we went back to Web 2.5 now, slashed it in half. So, kind of, 
thinking about that, um, you know, maybe uh, what, what is your guys' point of view of like to reach that Web 2.5, that bridge, right, between Web 2 to Web 3? Is it to make everything invisible, to make the experience yeah, kind I, of I, like pulled I, back? I, I think you got, you got to not make it about the technology and make it as easy as possible to uh, lessen the onboarding cliff. It's kind of a cliff right now. Um, uh, you know, uh, another thing about it is like you just never know. We we built on Solana because we thought it was easy and it, and it's beautiful. It's it's really great. And, and then you know, I was on I was at this event in uh, uh, in um, oh man uh, Portugal and uh, in Lisbon, and it was like the best blockchain event I'd been to. It's a it's a Solana event, and we're celebrating Solana, and it was amazing. And then on the plane on the way back. I find out that FTX is like unwinding, and FTX has like a 30% overhang of Solana on their books, um, and uh, and that you know our business, uh, part of our business, our wallet is built on Solana. Uh, it's a mess. Like, what am I going to say? Like, uh, you know, the the idea that you have to sign in and and get people uh, to buy to get a wallet and understand cryptographic keys, understand what simming is, and how to protect your online identity, and like learn about the basics about security and password management. I mean, I would, be, I would be shocked if not everyone in this room was using a password manager right now. How many of you are not using a password manager right now? You may not want to raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> you all should be. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that's the problem with the space. It's very complicated um, for, for first-time users. So. Yeah, I, I echo the same sentiment. I think one of the, it, it kind of brings it back to what I said earlier, right? The, the whole, you're making that trade-off. You're making that trade-off of facility versus like, you know, great power comes great responsibility. And in this case, if you're going to own something of value, then you have to accept that there's hurdles that you have to, you have to, you know, be okay with. And yes, most gamers do not necessarily want to go through the onboarding hurdle of a wallet. I, it's hard enough to get a gamer to say, all right, enter your email, and then when you enter that, go to your inbox and click this authentication link that we sent you, and uh, go ahead and enter your password. No, 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 you have to add a special character to that one, and it's gotta be longer. It's too long, let's make it shorter. And like, people are just like, I don't wanna deal with this, I just wanna play the game that I'm not even sure I'm gonna play, that I'm, even, I'm not even sure I'm gonna like. So to tell them, now you have to learn all this other Web3 stuff in order to even start playing the game is a huge turnoff. And, and so what do we have left to do? Well, what we have left to do is to say, hey, don't worry about it. We're going to own all of your stuff. Don't worry about it. And uh, that way it'll be easy. Oh, but it's not going to be my stuff, right? No, 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 it'll be under your name, just like in the banks. You know how the banks work, right? Yeah, so it's just going to be like that. And so they get this false sense of security, but at the end of the day, they never really cared. And that's the internal debate we have at Unity right now. Actually, a lot of us that are really passionate about the Web3 tech, the small circles within Unity, we talk about this all the time. It's like we want to empower players with, with sovereign tools. And then the other side of the argument is like, well, they don't care about it. They want to just play the game. They, they don't really care if it's sovereign. We're trying to make it so simple for them that they don't even realize it's there. Then why do they want it? Why do you want a Lamborghini so that you can drive it 30 miles in, on a 30 mile per hour road? It, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you get the bragging rights, but you don't get to drive the car. Like, granny in a Corolla is outpacing you at that point. So, so yeah, that, that's kind of where we're at right now. It's this sort of like, how do you get people onboarded? How do you get gamers to really get into this? And that's why I think the gamers in Web3 are a special crowd. They're a special crowd. They're people who just want to try something new, and they're willing to learn really complex, esoteric stuff to get in on it early. And those guys are rock stars because they help us kind of build those games, and we can actually bring them to fruition and move this at a baby's pace one step at a time. If those guys weren't there, we'd be building these games for no one, really. No one would be playing them. Yeah, that's, that's certainly true. And, and and on the topic of like kind of gamers as well too, um, especially maybe what have you seen on the Unity side and Raul um, building and, and building your guys' own game as well. Um, it's also a difference in like gaming culture, right? Like you know, like you said, you go to like maybe GDC. It's only the publishers that care because they want to make money. Developers, they're like, and eh, that's just another thing they have to like hassle and learn. Um, but then you go to maybe that's why E3 didn't want to host like Web3 in there, right? Like normal gamers in the U.S. Uh, and even Europe and Western countries just hate NFTs, they hate Web3, maybe because we stole all their GPUs for mining um, during the ETH run <laughs> as well, so they couldn't buy their 4090s and 39s as well. But you go to the, 
the east side as well, it's a whole different story over there, right? In Southeast Asia, uh, it's just blowing up. Um, and this is outside of even just regulation as well, right? Um, I guess do you interface and see kind of like the difference between like the developers and the games coming on from, from that uh, perspective and kind of just hear your thoughts on like... Just generally yeah. speaking, uh, the, 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 the game culture or, or people who play games or people who want to have fun playing games, uh, typically the Web3 space is people who grind to make money in the game. Uh, they're not having fun. Like, very few Web3 games are fun right now. Um, and, uh, and it's all about money or whatever it is and speculation. It's, again, it's the wrong behavior. There's a reason that gamers hate NFTs and stuff. It's because they see their favorite influencer pumping NFTs and, and doing it all about money and then disappearing or rug pulls or all this sort of stuff. Let me be straight. Like, 97% of the projects out there are either scams or are gonna fall apart uh, for one reason or another. 3% of them are good, and they're going to have to get through like some rocky roads. I've been through four bear markets in this space, and every time a bull market happens, a whole new wave of people come into the space. I'm a massive Bitcoiner, and I believe in the future of this space. Um, but it's, a not, it's not fun. Like It's a roller coaster of uh, really low lows and really high highs. So, yeah. Yeah, I think you pretty much said most of what I would say as well. It's just... At the end of the day, when it comes to gaming, that's just the limitations that we have with the audience that we have today. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of more topics to kind of cover, and hopefully we'll uh, be able to cover them in another future uh, Unleashed Summit here as well. But uh, I want to thank again both uh, Kelvin and, and Raul for sharing kind of like their deep insights and knowledge. And thanks again, Ari and, the, and Dan and the team here for uh, hosting as well. So um, where can people kind of uh, find you guys as well and get in touch? Uh, yeah, for, for me, you can find me on LinkedIn at um, Rahul Sood. It's is just my name, no middle name. And on Twitter as well, at Rahul Sood. Yeah, you can find me here on stage, there on the floor, or on LinkedIn as well. So just come in, ask me for a card or whatever, and we'll just chat it up. And, uh, but yeah, you'll find that picture on LinkedIn. I know it looks nothing like me, but that's the one, <laughs> that's the one you're going to find. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, give them a round of applause, and thanks again for uh, tuning in the panel. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Huge fans of these guys. Um, if you find them, go and talk to them. Get a picture with them. Get a boomerang with them. Uh, make it a note industry. Thank you so much, guys, for being a part of this pivotal event in history. All right. We are going to be moving on to our next panel. But first, you get a break. A full 15-minute break. Woo! All right, so next up we're gonna have Brigetta, Mark Yusko, Jeffrey Arone, and Dan McMorris, the speakers, if you could come back and start getting mic'd up. The rest of you, drink uh, refreshments, not the alcohol kind. The alcohol kind will be arriving very shortly. Definitely take advantage of the photo booth, do a boomerang. Our team of wholesale friends would love it if you took lots of photos and then posted it on Twitter and LinkedIn using hashtag Web3Unleashed. And um, shake hands, fist palms, hugs, smile, build community. And um, I think Brigetta also has copies of her book here. So if you haven't checked it out, I have a copy and I'm going to have her autograph it. Um, you do or do not? You do? Yeah, she does. She's right there. She's going to be the moderator for the next panel. Um, author of Wealthcare, Demystifying Web3 and the Rise of Personal Data Economy. So if you haven't checked this book out, pretty amazing read. So um, yeah, just be on the lookout for that. And I'll see you at about 4 o'clock. Thank you.
Situations got me pulling and trying. In my heart, I'm slowly dying. Fall away, slip away is what I'm buying. In a cold state of mind, only denying. Where I'm at and what I'm feeling was real. Shit, I fall to my knees, I just chill. After that, I think back. Always wanted this kind of outro, wishing I could go back and tell everything I now know to a younger me, looking up at 23, filled up with anxiety to overcome what's underneath, and let him know he onto something, but he got some problems coming. You'll feel like you need a lot, but you'll act like you're wanting nothing. It's like you're paralyzed, can't move because you're terrified, mind inside a paradigm where you don't even dare to try. So you just lay at night, wide awake, with grandeurs of a way of life, where everything is perfect till you open those ungrateful eyes. It's kind of like your place to hide. So instead, you'll do everything they say to do You'll get a corporate job and make 100k out of school The music still be working at it with your far from perfect habits I wish that I could tell you that everything will be fine But I'm not really sure I'm qualified to Because I thought I'd know what to say by now And honestly, I thought I'd be in LA by now Instead, I'm wasting all my time like I've got nothing to prove Sit alone and ruin my day just for something to do And it's been the same for years without an evolution Claim to be the next to do it without ever executing I got a mixture of excuses and a list of resolutions And feel guilty doing anything unless I've been productive But time doesn't wait, so I'm just missing moments I'm getting older without getting any closer Every week I board another flight that takes me farther from my goals And leaves me at a destination that is hardly like a home So now I'm out of sorts and feeling out of pocket I'm drifting out of port, I'm set on autopilot And just to pay the price so I can pay the rent And 
either pay attention or feel this pain again. And honestly, I'm terrified that I'ma die and be forgotten quickly. If I go out, I don't know if there's a lot who'd miss me. Hopefully, I really have a soulmate, so at least I'll have a body beside mine to be rotten with me. My mind has been making all these obstacles. Some days I wake up and I feel like I'm unstoppable. And then the next day it feel like it's all impossible. The world is at my fingers, but there's nowhere else I want to go. And last night I finally hit my limit. Liquor in my system, but never had clearer vision. Punching walls and throwing keys, glass shards and broken screens. I couldn't keep blaming life for problems, because I know it's me. The root of all these issues is the lack of all my actions. Tired of feeling like I'm not committed to my passions. And as the tears flow, I had a moment of clarity. Feeling like I'm finally hearing all the things I would say to me Like, I'm begging you to cut the axe and the annex It isn't any kind of magic, ain't no rabbit and hat trick It's just maximum actions and bats with natural talent And it's gonna actually happen once you can ask the distractions But right now nobody's nearing ya And doing nothing is your mode and your median You wanna flounder, you should go to aquariums The block is mine like I'm own in Ethereum I know you can hear me, but it's slow and I'm fearing You gon' end up like another fucking old bit of sneering man just walk around with absolutely no need for air and lungs an old testament back to times when no one will pair him up so please just for a minute put a hold on the snare and drums give me a moment to share the love and if you're over it fair enough just let me know now do you really want the gold or are you here for fun because if it's the latter i'll happily in the banter you can get on that plane and live happily ever after but i saw the way you got up this morning you haven't smiled since you stopped your recording and i won't raise my voice now because i'm tired of yelling nobody's buying your charade so why you trying to sell it so this affecting those who love you and believe in you the ones who want to see you do the shit that you've been meaning to so treat this like you want it or get treated for this problem you can't go through life happen with these clouds around your conscious you know you need to live each day deliberate because regret is unforgiven you got choices now show me which one is it and i'm not worried about the numbers or the press of the streams just prove to me that you can focus on your dreams or else just give it up and move on pack your bags and put your suit on I just wanna love me as much as you love me. I just wanna love me as much as you love me. As much as you love me. I know the sun gon' shine in the morning, but I just wanna love me as much as you love me. I just wanna love me. As much as you love me, as much as you love me, I know the sun gon' shine in the morning, but I, I just wanna love me, as much as you love me, I just wanna love me, as much as you love me, as much as you love me, I know the sun gon' shine in the morning. I just want to love me as much as you love me. I just want to love me as much as you love me. As much as you love me. Yeah, I said the sun gon' shine in the morning, but I, I just want
One, two, three. Check, check. One, two, three. This is the last panel before all the drinking ensues. I know we like our cocktails based on yesterday. Right? <coughs> Hello. <coughs> Hi. Hello. Hi. I love. 
love you and I miss you over here. Black chairs, this is the last panel. Last panel, hello. Hi, I need attention. Hi, I need attention over here. Please come over here, come over here. This last panel needs our attention. And you want to give them your attention because this is amazing panel. I don't want you to miss this. Last panel and then drinks will ensue and flow. And we can do shot, 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 shot. Yeah, 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 all right. Is everyone, you hear me? Please come here. Please come over here. I love you. I'm sharing warmth. I'm beaming love to you. Do you feel it? I haven't had a drink yet. Can you tell? Wait till I start drinking. Hey, people at the door. People at the door, I need your attention. All right, we're gonna begin the investor panel for 2023. Our panelist is Brigitte Panuski, author of Wealth Care, Demystifying Web3 and the Rise of Personal Data Economies. If you haven't picked up this book, please pick it up. I think she brought up some copies. But Brigetta is a physician, angel investor, and author covering the intersection of health and technology. Her book, Wealth Care, Demystifying Web3 and the Rise of Personal Data Economies, is a stepwise approach to the why, where, and how a Web3 ethos and a blockchain-based solutions will transform our health while providing the foundation for society's next wealth inflection. Please welcome Brigetta Pinuski. Yay! Oh, you're gonna be here, so I'm yeah, just right. gonna stay in here for a little bit longer. Please. Mark Yusko is our next speaker. Uh, we were, I was personally completely enthralled and speechless throughout his entire keynote this morning. So uh, you don't need another uh, bio reading of him. He's super awesome. If you don't follow him on Twitter, follow him on Twitter. He is prolific. He drops knowledge left and right, as you saw. And we are very, very lucky to have him here with us today. Next up, we have Jeffrey Arone. And I hope I'm spelling that, you know, pronouncing that correctly. Um, Jeffrey Arone is an established blockchain and internet investor, advisor, and executive. His experience varies from co-founder and partner of a greater than $100 million crypto hedge fund to VP marketing and chief scientist of a multi-billion dollar global company to startup CEO with successful exits. Jeffrey is currently co-founder and CEO of Logos and a partner at Arrington Cap XRP Capital, a hedge fund focused on crypto ass assets and blockchain technology. He has invested in more than 50 cryptocurrency companies since 2017. Uh, early in his career, he helped create the social web and social media before they were the media buzz terms. He was co-founder of Flock, acquired by Zynga, and Safety Web, acquired by Experian. He has raised more than $100 million in investment from top VCs like Bessemer Venture Partners, Battery Ventures, Shasta Ventures, and Fidelity Ventures. He's also successfully exited multiple companies and continues to advise and invest in new ones. He's an MBA from MIT, uh, another degree in neuroscience from Brown, and he did not finish his PhD in neuroscience, which was funded by the National Institute of Health. Wow. <laughs> That's all I can say. Wow. Please welcome Jeffrey to the stage. And then we're going to welcome Dan McMorris. Daniel McMorris is a blockchain and distributed ledger enthusiast applying DLT to the enterprise use case as co-founder and chief strategy officer of the Providence Chain Network. In addition, he's an accredited individual investor focusing on both traditional and alternative asset classes, including crypto and digital assets. He's developed an approach to teach the crypto and digital asset space to new entrants, has presented this approach to individuals, family offices, university investment clubs, and has provided feedback to the Fed Working Group on CBDCs. He sits on numerous blockchain advisory boards, is the creator of the Commercial Trust Protocol, and has an MBA from the Mendoza School of Business at Notre Dame. Hey, two Notre Neighbors. Welcome, Dan. All right, while well, you guys are in great hands with Brigetta, I am gonna get out of your hair and have fun. Thanks. Well, let the record show that it's only be us and you, and then networking afterwards. So 
last panel until we get to that. The most important panel because it's investment time. Without investment, it would be difficult to scale and create the solutions that we've heard today. And thanks so much for T-Mobile for sponsoring us because the straight talk, and if you were here at the last panel, for instance, it's amazing the type of information you can get from coming to these types of sessions. Thank you so much to my panelists for joining us today. We'll jump right into the questions and feel free to go ahead and answer anyone that you're interested in, all right? We're starting with how do you see the crypto and digital asset market evolving in the next few years? What impact will this have on the traditional markets? I, I'll, I'll always talk, so um, <laughs> you haven't probably figured that out about me. A uh, couple things. So one, um, I think we're in the third phase of, of the four phases. So uh, like the famous Gandhi quote that Gandhi didn't say, and I wish I could remember who actually said it, but they always attribute it to Gandhi. Uh, first, they ignore you. So that was 2009 to 2015. A bunch of nerds and geeks playing with their magic internet money. Then they laugh at you, 2016 to 21. Ugh, nerds and geeks, magic internet money, whatever. Then they fight you. We're in the then they fight you phase right now. It's 2022 to 2027, unfortunately. It's going to be a long fight. Uh, but the good news is then you win. I will argue if you're here and in this space, you, you've already won. Uh, as I said earlier today, I, I do think this is the greatest wealth creation opportunity I'll, I'll definitely see in my lifetime. There's some younger people. Maybe they'll see a, a bigger one. But as we think about the evolution, we've gone from you know, the, the, the science project and the nerds and the geeks to the reality of this blockchain standard that I, you know, I really do believe is the backbone for all transfer of value and all property rights in the future, which is, those are two big, big things. So, uh, you know, where are we in, in, the, in that process early, really early, how early? Players entered the stadium, maybe, maybe we sang the national anthem, uh, but the game really hasn't even gotten started. And um, on top of that, there's this other cycle that has to do really with, with uh, Bitcoin halvings uh, and boom and bust. And I think on May 9th, my birthday, big 6-0, uh, is the official start of crypto summer. Uh, so about nine months ahead of the, the halving next year. Okay. Um. All right, cool. I always have to get used to the sound levels because it's not like karaoke where it's where I spend most of my time with a mic. Um, so yeah, I agree with everything um, Mark just said, and I can I can guess that they too were around for the dot com days when it was a very kind of similar thing. And I think you know in in my lifetime, there's been, you know, two key transformational things that, well, actually three if you count mobile, but no one really fought mobile. Um, when internet and dot-coms emerged, there were n no shortage of naysayers and regulators at the state and federal level that were trying to figure out how to tax things and why things were unfair. There were like, if someone met on Facebook where there were hundreds of millions of people and they got murdered, it was like the Facebook murder. But you can live in a, a town of 50,000 people and someone gets run over by a car and it barely makes the news, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no shortage of people right now just like waiting for crypto to trip up. But I will say this, when I don't like to necessarily engage in very specific arguments about why crypto is awesome, but I will say, what entity or institution can you think of has had an onslaught of basically every major government, every major economy, every major uh, financial institution at the same time yeah. trying to destroy it yeah. and still survive. And people, you know, a lot of folks will say, yeah, this is the, another, um, you know, nuclear winter for crypto. Um, pretty sure my dates are, are within a month of accuracy, but in May of 2020, Bitcoin, excuse me, um, ETH was down to 120s, 130s. It closed at numbers of that level. And here we are three years later. Actually, that was March. Um, here we are three years later, and it's, you know, hanging around 2,000. So I'd say that's a pretty good investment. 
for, for anyone, right? So as bad as it is, I think there's only upside at this point, but that is not investment advice. And you should speak to a professional <laughs> financial advisor before making decisions. Past yes, performance no is no indication advice. of future returns. <laughs> We were talking about that. And Brigitte, I've got a unique, I think, a different uh, investment thesis that's informed uh, the approach I've taken over the last decade or so. And one of that is that I think we're in the middle of a financial and economic shift, a change. Uh -huh. It's not necessarily going to continue the way that it has in the past. And so one of the things that as I've talked to family offices and personally invested in this area and its alternative assets overall, is that I think we're gonna come to an area within crypto where we have two different markets. We will see a foreign market, call it East, and a Western market, two separate. And I think evidence to that would be Gary Gensler in the last week, talking about not having financial uh, regulatory clarity, and yet, or I'm sorry, not having regulatory compliance when he can't speak to the clarity that is needed. And any time that you've got that discrepancy, there's going to be problems. And every single United States exchange for crypto has now been affected, including Bitrix that we just had this yeah. week. Yeah. And the impact to new investors, the people that have already invested in this space are gonna have their assets. If you have your keys, you own your assets, you've got it. But new entrants that now, it's gonna be very, very difficult for new entrants to come into this space, at least in America. And I think part of that might be intentional if you look at it through the lens of might. this. Might, might. Okay, I'm trying to be, good, right. Yeah. And I think it's intentional because of the capital flight that they're trying to keep into the current system, right, of the U.S. dollar. So it's a, it's a long-winded answer, Brigitte, but I think we're going to start seeing the split between the, the Eastern and Western financial systems, and part of that will impact the crypto market as we think of it today. And I guess the, the thought that I would have is if you want to get in, now's the time to get in and make sure you're securing your own crypto. Yeah, can I double tap on two points just real yeah. quick? So one is... Um, the, 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 the Gensler playbook is called Nikki Saab. <laughs> and we've all played it in our life. It's called Now I Got You, You Son of a Bitch. And the way it works is your wife says, or your, bigger, your, your, your better half, whoever that happens to be, says, make me happy. O -o okay. Uh, flowers. Didn't make me happy. Dinner. Didn't make me happy. Now I got you. And so... If you don't tell me what I'm supposed to do, how do, I, how do I do it? The second thing is American exceptionalism. Americans are like Notre Dame football fans. We remember a past that never what do you mean? was. <laughs> no, we remember a past that never was, right? I mean, my father-in-law believes that Notre Dame wins the championship every year. We have not won a championship since 1988. It's like, but when I was there, we won every year. I'm like, yes, from 1944 to 1948, we won four years in a row. Why? because the coach went to Europe during the war and got all the guys from Army and Navy to come back as 28-year-olds and had a semi-pro team for four years. You don't get to do that anymore except at BYU. So <laughs> this idea that we matter, I mean, I tweeted about this the other day, Bitcoin does not care right, right. if the US bans it. Bitcoin does not care about Gary Gensler and the fact that Gary is intentionally- Or any exchange. Or, or any exchange, yeah. It, it's, I, I, I remember when uh, Zuck got uh, called to, to Congress, you know, they, they subpoenaed the CEO of Bitcoin, but they were unavailable. <laughs> so do we, I was with busy. American exceptionalism. <laughs> Satoshi, oh, we found Satoshi. Oh, we found Satoshi. <laughs> so on that point, with American exceptionalism, do we not learn from our mistakes? Will Bit Bitrix not teach us anything? Uh, I can't speak for all of America. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I've always been, um, my biggest thing has been repatriating these companies once they figure out the stupid laws. So what I would tell a lot, a lot of companies would be like, oh, you know exactly what to do. No one knows exactly what to do. Right. But you don't try and, you know, just like Mark was saying, if, if you don't know what you could possibly do, you don't know whether they want flowers, bark treatment, or just want you to leave. Mm -hmm. um, often number three, but um, if you don't know that, go somewhere else where you at least have some sense of that. Right. And then once bigger economies that are, realize that they can't stop it are ready to embrace it, I think the economies, the major players that will win are those that allow all the experiments to happen in smaller economies mm -hmm. and then are able to repatriate. That's part, part of my thinking is that there's, you know, it is intentional, 
And it's very easy to grandstand in the short term mm -hmm. and play off of the fears and assuage the, you know, major finance, big finance. But at some point when it matters, trust me, they'll be a lot faster about figuring out who to bring back. Okay. Well, that's hopeful. Well, on the true answer to your question about learning, uh -huh. right? So if you take history, and if you're going to be a student of history, we've had four different financial systems, completely different financial systems in the last century. And most people are none the wiser. And what we're doing, so it's 1913, 1933, 1943, and then 1971. Uh -huh. And what we are witnessing now is the unwind of each of those. And if you can see that happening, you can start to predict and start to position yourself in terms of your investments, what's going to happen next. And that is part of what you're talking about, right? If we're aware and we can see that, now you're, you can make wise investments as far as what's going to be necessary on the other side of the next one that we're going through. And that's the, honestly the answer. I would also, well, I can't say I encourage this, but if I were a student of history, you probably want to invest in Bitcoin now anyways, because you're not going to make a lot as a history person. <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love history. But. I, think, I think the other part about a mistake is you have to admit that it's a mistake. Yeah. The, the powers that be don't believe they're making a mistake. They, they believe they're doing the right thing to preserve their hegemony. Mm -hmm. And look, we, we cut a deal in 1971 that has been pretty good for the people at the very tippy top. It's been really mm -hmm. bad for everybody else, but it's really, really good for the people at the top. And they're the people that cut the deal. And what they did is they said, all right, Saudi, we will protect you at all costs if, capital I, capital F, if you price all global transactions in dollars. Today, 8% of global trade is done with the United States, and 60% of global trade is financed in dollars. That's good for the dollar. Mm -hmm. Now you have a transactional currency that threatens that hegemony. First is the RMB, which I think will be the interim step before uh, you get to uh, Bitcoin. But ultimately, that, that hegemony was enforced historically by violence, by naval superiority. So if you go back to the 1400s, it's Portugal. Why Portugal? Imagine Portugal was the world reserve currency for 75 years, the most powerful nation on the planet for 75 years. Why? Because they had the tallest ships, because they had the highest trees, the tallest trees, so they're the fastest ships. Spain takes them over, okay? Then Spain becomes number one. France takes them over, they're number one. The Netherlands takes them over. How the hell did that happen? The Rothschilds set up the central bank in 1607, financed their war to take over. Then half the Rothschilds went to the UK. They took over with the steamship. Then we get nuclear power, and we've been the hegemonic superpower ever since 1944. What China figured out a decade ago is the next war ain't gonna be fought with ships. It's gonna be fought with chips. It is all, all about superiority of cyber, mm -hmm. of AI, 5G, we're sitting in the 5G space. It's all about that. And that's why China, you know, they, they also think in, in long-term uh, plans, right? We can't even decide what's gonna happen next year in the United States. They think in 30-year increments. So from 1990 to 2020, they had a 30-year plan to be they called it the harmonious rise. They wanted to become a moderately prosperous nation. And they took 300 million people, I'm sorry, 700 million, 700 million people out of abject poverty into the middle class. 700 million people. And they became a moderately prosperous society, second largest in the world. Their next 30 year plan is to become the, not a, the superpower. And I think it will happen. And I think the renminbi will be the super world reserve currency. And then ultimately, people will realize that digital assets are a better form than CBDCs. You said the, the F word as far as I'm concerned. CBDCs are pure evil in every way. And if you don't believe me, Google Augustin Karstens and watch the minute 47 of, I used to call him Jabba the Hutt, but he actually looks more like Kingpin from the multiverse movie. This guy is 500 pounds if he's an ounce, and he explains why, of course, they should have control of how you and I spend our money, Scary. if we can spend it, when we can spend it, how we can spend it, or whether they should take it. 
And that's a frightening dystopian nightmare. And so the answer to this frightening dystopian nightmare, of course, is correct investment. Correct investment in the right places for the right reasons at the right time, which is why we have our panel here today. So let's get back to our investment questions. We are asking about NFTs with their recent popularity. What do you think the future is for this market? How can investors take advantage of it? change the course of the future. We have like it. Chicago politics, early and often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brigitte, I'll, I'll jump on in this one. I think the, the traditional answer is going to be into something like a crypto kick or, or whatever it is. And I think that there's going to be value there, absolutely. I'm excited for the next wave of NFTs. Um, as an example, within Provenance Chain, and part of our investment thesis as a family office decided that we needed to build out this Provenance Chain network rather than starting to look at other uh, potential returns with capital. So looking at this one, the application of NFTs next for businesses is going to be a digital representation of the physical product. Mm -hmm. And that digital representation, as Jeff was talking earlier here, is going to interact with many different people. And so there's going to be NFTs for people, for places, and for products, and likely even for transactions. And all of that would be digitally owned. And so that aspect, the value and the data that you have inside of those NFTs, if you will, will make the products and services that you sell more valuable to the people that are looking at it. Rather than just looking at you know, some of the art that, Mark, you put on the screen, completely amazing in terms of where it's going to go. Absolutely, by the way. But in addition, where I'm personally excited is the businesses that are going to help, I'm sorry, the projects that are going to help businesses apply the technology to their current business processes. That's really what I think the next phase for NFTs is for me. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. I've actually done one of those for physical art, you know, as it ties to NFTs. We could talk about that for sure afterwards. Um, <clears throat> for me, I, I've invested in a bunch of really stupid NFTs. Um, the stupidest one was cowboy punks. I was like, oh, they have crypto punks. These cowboy punks are going to be awesome. I didn't pay a lot for them, <clears throat> but it's in this bucket of NFTs I have where the gas fees of just sending them off are too much money, or it's a bad investment to dump them. Um, now, what I didn't, the ones that really appealed to me, I'll give you an example of one that I helped design uh, with a company I invested in called DVIN. And it's, the, it's a club, right? And it actually has, so I think the, you know, certain types of club NFTs that act as a card, but also give you access to things like art and also are tied to a, a physical asset. So a membership of Divin, you buy it, you get an, a nice little NFT membership card. Um, that entitles you to purchase any number of different wines and participate in IRL events. Um, when you buy a bottle of wine through them, it actually, you will get a small little NFT and you get tasting tokens for these, yeah. right? And so every time you go out with friends, you open a special bottle of wine, it'll create these little NFTs for the people that enjoy it. So it creates memories, it really, it codifies this and you can build up a collection of these things. I don't see that necessarily as um, a model where if you're talking about pure wealth creation, no, actual like kind of utility and fun with an NFT that isn't completely stupid. Yeah, there, it encourages, um, it also, by the way, has the utility of you can transfer assets. So a lot of things that you buy, a lot of the wine that you can buy, they will store it for you, and then I can just give you the NFT, and it'll stay stored, but that NFT allows you to redeem it for a bottle, right? So I think in that sense, an NFT really does make sense. Um, in terms of art, yeah, there's, there's definitely some very complex art projects that can only be done, that I've seen that can be done um, with NFTs. My co-founder recently did one with, um, with art blocks and it was recently shown at the New York Met. And that was an amazing project where they combined music, motion, dance, and technology to create these randomly generated beautiful images. And I won't get into everything else about it, but yes, there is a future. It won't be you know, strictly stupid little pictures. Yeah, look, NFTs, I, I, I believe, 
is, is, is going to be everything. Everything you own will be an NFT. Every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of real estate, anything that can be titled in the world will, will be an NFT. All, it, all an NFT is is a line item on a blockchain. That's all it is. It's an entry on a ledger. And everything will ultimately be an NFT. Now, the first applications, art, collectibles, a um, couple things. So I grew up here, and I used to go to 7-Eleven all the time. And I had a massive collection of Slurpee cups. I had Roberto Clemente. I had Larry Zonka. I had Willie Stargell. I had, and my mom threw them all freaking way. I mean, I'm still mad. I mean, so now, the one guy who kept his Mickey Mantle baseball card that didn't get destroyed is worth $5 million. Why? Because it's scarce. Anything that is scarce can go up in value. So I have a... a I'm going to call him a friend, but associate, another Notre Dame guy, Nicholas Sparks, the writer. So he commissioned a guy long before NFTs to paint a single picture called one. It's a one of one. And the moment that he took possession of it, it went from the you know, few tens of thousands that he paid for it to worth millions because it's a one of one, also owned by Nicholas Sparks, which a lot of his fangirls would want to own. But... Anything that's scarce will create value. And so in art and collectibles, there's plenty of places you can play. The, the difference is NFTs also allow for a community, right? You can have a membership. You can be part of a community. They can get access. Imagine a world, a normal world, not run by the bad bots, where you're an owner of an NFT, that you're part of the T-Swift NFT co community, and you actually got a ticket to her concert instead of trying to compete with the bots. Or when I tried to buy my son a PS5 years ago, this 14-year-old kid had written a script to buy all the PS5s from Walmart. He literally bought them all. Like, I want to hire that kid, like, right now. Don't go to college. Just come work with me. And you can get a PS5 for two years because he had bought them all. And so, but being a member of that community would give you a right to participate and in, the reason she's having to go back on tour, right, is because she lost all the money to the le record album who sold her collection. So now she's got to wait for some period of time before she can re-release. She'll be fine. Um, but the point is that direct access to your fan base, ownership of uh, creators owning their content. I mean, think about, I mean, I, I love the thing on gaming, right? I spent a lot of time since 2020. So during lockdown, my son got me to play Pokemon Go. And I'm way addicted. Don't look at my phone, what I was doing on the way here. Let's talk after this. OK, we should. <laughs> and my Pokemon Go collection should be worth a lot of money, because I've converted time and energy into value. It's valuable, and they can beat the crap out of other people's mons. But I can't monetize it, because Niantic, frickin' monolithic Niantic owns it all on their servers. The other thing I play a lot of is Magic the Gathering. Same. And that is driving me crazy that I have spent a lot of time, like way too much time, ask my wife, playing this silly game. And now I have cards that are really valuable, but they're not mine. They belong to Wizards of the Coast. Fucking kids. Can I just talk <laughs> about this for a second? So. Uh, like 2016, my parents had their 50th. We had nephews and nieces and my own kids, and everyone was psyched about Pokemon Go. They dragged me into this thing, and then like a couple of years later, I'm still gunning for a level 40, and they abandoned. They left me. They left. They tease they left. me now. Yes, yes, De my gentlemen, son, yes. Gentlemen, yes. Yeah. this is an investment panel. OK. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good investment. But I invested in Magic the Gathering cards. Okay. Did you really? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. Investors have hobbies. <laughs> so let's get into what are the biggest risks associated with investing in cryptocurrencies and digital assets and, shall we say, digital games, as well as how can they be mitigated? Well, the biggest risk that's not a risk that everyone thinks is a risk is volatility. I have a shirt. I should have worn it today. It says, embrace volatility. Volatility is not your enemy. It's actually your friend. Name an asset in the world that has this low volatility that you would like to own. I'll wait. You don't, 
you don't want to own low volatility assets. You want to own high volatility assets. What you want to own is a distributed portfolio of super high volatility assets that are uncorrelated to one another. That's what Markowitz won his Nobel Prize for. And so people perceive Bitcoin to have high volatility. I showed the slide. It has the same volatility as Amazon, but a dollar invested in Bitcoin 10 years ago is worth more than a dollar invested in Amazon, even though they have the same volatility, because the compound return is higher. The net return is higher, and because it's uncorrelated, if you take, I, I loved it, they call it the rat poison portfolio, which is Microsoft, Google, two other companies, I can't remember, equally weighted over the last 10 years is compounded 20%. If you took 2% and added it to Bitcoin, it goes up to 24% compounded. You say, well, how can that be? It had an 84% correction. Yes, it did, but at a different time than the other things did. So, that volatility is the risk that's perceived that isn't real. Risk in investing is permanent impairment of capital. It's the only risk that matters, I think. So I've got a, diff uh, a different approach. Is when I'm talking to an advising family office, it depends on your investment thesis as well. So as an example, you're coming into this financial change. And if we have a new financial change, you know, how do you mitigate for the risk? Well. Part of it is an investment in non-traditional assets, including your knowledge, your network, your mm -hmm. skills. Those in this phase are valid. So the people here, you're investing in your knowledge. And I think that that is going to pay huge dividends on the other side of this. The other side from a traditional investment, Brigitte, right, when we're investing into these cryptos, people here understand this space. But the other, this is what, 18% of the population, roughly, right, that owns or understand this space. It's no different than investing in stocks if you use the same rules. You come in, you have to understand the project and understand the value, understand the leadership and trust the leadership. And if you have those three things, you can invest. And if you don't, that's how you, if you don't, don't invest. Don't step in. And so it applies to this crypto space as well. Everyone here understands private keys, but that's a new concept to people outside of these four walls that don't understand how crypto works and how the investment, what's the value? Digital scarcity is something new to them. But when you approach them with this thesis and you say, okay, this is what it is, and you explain to them that it's changing, invest in your skills and your knowledge, and then approach crypto the same way you do for stocks or bonds, it starts to make things less intimidating. And I think that's one of the areas that you can mitigate risk in this transition for everybody. I, I agree. And by the way, how many people do you guys talk to still that think the US dollar is backed by the gold standard? <laughs> I, it's crazy. I mean, some pretty bright people. I'm like, they're like, well, I have that Bitcoin. Where does this value come from? Like, where does the dollar value come from? Yeah. I mean, there's a very complex answer to that, but it's not a big pile of gold. Um, now, about volatility, what's really important, you know, we were just talking about asset-backed NFTs. Um, I've collected art and other like sports collectibles for years. And one thing that's interesting about it is the prices can be very volatile, but there are certain assets that I get really anxious if I, if I auction them off because if there's not, there are very particular buyers for certain things that are very, have very inelastic demand, right? They want this one thing and they don't care at all. Like I sold a, a card recently that I paid $400 for, for $9,000. Um, and, but then I've had other cards that were way more valuable where at that time there wasn't someone to buy it. So, um, the volatility of crypto and also something that I, I think people need to look out for when they invest in these you know, coins that go crazy is you have to look at the volumes and the order books for these things, right? When things are volatile, love it or hate it, it means that there is attention on it. There are people buying and selling it and so then it's incumbent upon you to figure out the best strategy if you're so inclined. The worst thing is a lot of these people that become like, you know, these crypto multimillionaires or more, but they, they're sitting on assets that no one wants to buy. And if you start selling these really expensive tokens, you can really manipulate the price unintentionally. Like, mm -hmm. you start moving the price. And I, this happened a lot in the early days of the fund when we we'd make these investments. It was very, very difficult to, for our auditors to tell them what it's worth because it, it's hard to explain to them, well, no one's buying and selling it, and so it's, 
sure, it's $400 a token. If you look at our $2 million investment, yeah, it's worth $100 million now. But if I sell like 10 of them, the price goes down to 50 bucks, right? So it's hard to really factor that in. That's yeah, liquidity is, 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 is a big real risk. And it's true of, of every asset that's traded. You know, you guys can relate to Microsoft stock, right? If, if you trade 100 shares, the price you see on Yahoo Finance is the price. If you have a million shares, that ain't the price. Yep. If you have 10 million shares, that is definitely not the price. So that's one real risk. The other real risk is these are bearer assets. Now, there are a lot of bearer assets in the world. Gold bars, art, uh, any, any collectible, Magic the Gathering cards, whatever. Wine. Wine, wine. Where, if you had a, a bottle of, of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, what would you do with it? Right? If it was worth thousands of dollars, would you put it under lock and key? Would you, I mean, you want to enjoy it? So how you store those assets is really, really important. Every stock certificate that y'all think you own, you don't own. UBS owns it, or Merrill Lynch owns it. You have an IOU, and that's money good, but you don't own it. It's actually in their name. It's in the street name of the brokerage firm, and you have an IOU. And we you heard the guys in, on the gaming panel talk about this. We give up that, that ability to get access to our stuff for protection and security. Same thing as if you put your Bitcoin on a ledger and hold it around your neck, it's, you've got it. Now you are subject to $5 wrench risk. And I heard someone say the other day, I'll never lose my Bitcoin because I would never give up my, my private keys. I'll go to my grave. I'm like, really? Someone's got a gun to your head, you're not gonna give up your keys, really? I don't know. So, or gun to your family's head, that's even worse. So the $5 wrench risk is real. And so we have to have systems in place to protect true bearer assets of any variety from theft, fire, pestilence, whatever. Um, and that's real. So we're still investing in the infrastructure then. Are you saying this R is infrastructure, the Infrastructure, big. Yeah, definitely. the most promising opportunities for blockchain technology is what in 2023? And how do you recommend approaching these investments? We do love infrastructure, for sure. So exchanges, software tools. Uh, my big thing, I believe, this year is, is wallets. I believe the wallet, particularly the hardware uh, security module, hard wallet, cold wallet, uh, will be the equivalent of the browser to Web 1 and the iPhone to Web 2. I think what, what Ledger actually is creating in their new product will be the Apple of, of Web 3. We'll see if that happens. But I do think the HSM uh, is the big deal. Um one thing I'm working on, it's, I mean, I guess we can be a little bit of a coming out party here, but um, a company that I funded that I'm running is focused on similarly with the wallets, but creating a level of security that allows, gives the user control, but allows them to, if you make a transaction, it immediately will ensure the security of the transaction and the people with whom you're transacting. And so it'll just take us just one step in front to prevent you from getting, you know, scammed or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I like that. Yeah, NFTs, I like that. A delay. So, and uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. The, I'm yeah. kind of limited because the patent attorneys hate me. But. <laughs> you know, one of the things I just, I, I want to double tap on somebody earlier to talk about zero knowledge proofs. I think that segment um, and the difference between privacy and secrecy Secrecy, you're going to invoke the wrath and the ire of, of governments and, and, and big actors that you can't combat against. Privacy, we all have a fundamental right to. And no one should be able to see all of my history and details when I want to buy a Magic the Gathering card using crypto. So that's got to get fixed. And I just met with an entrepreneur in Durham who has an interesting kind of overlay, same idea, where they can give you the, all this, the protection and the privacy of, say, a Zcash without invoking the ire of the government by using uh, zero knowledge proofs. I think that has to happen to get widespread adoption. Because it, it's, it's a freaky thing the first time someone says, hey, I saw that you have such and such. I'm like, how, how did you see that? Well, I went to MetaMask, and there it is. Yeah. Like, whoa, whoa. And DNS names are kind of funny because I like the concept of it, but it's also 
Yeah, yeah. markusco.eth is then causing me a lot of stress for yeah. that exact reason. You know, there was something, oh, sorry. Um, I'll be fast. <laughs> okay. It's just so related to this. Um, <laughs> so when I was, I was at, I sold a company to Experian and, and um, it was my ID, which eventually became their ID protection product. Um, when I was doing, I was chief scientist there and I was doing very early research on um, blockchain. I raised the temperature of a whole building to um, nine, over 90 degrees and they had to evacuate the building because of OSHA rules. Because I had, I just had a floor of ant miners running. <laughs> Um, yeah, they didn't care about the Bitcoin at that time, too. Um, so, anyways, there was a, something I came up with then that I, I wrote up, and it's the concept of authenticated anonymous, right? It's one thing to be anonymous, but another thing to be anonymous and be able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's a real entity behind it. And I look at this, you know, the, the use case I was... I came up with that, you know, never saw the light of day, so anyone in this room, feel free to, to steal it, um, was initially to fight kind of like discrimination on things like insurance or to get a quote for something where you don't necessarily want to reveal, oh, I have this pre-existing condition. I want to be able to, to say in a very, in a proven, um, you know, verified manner that this is me, this has my whatever information about me, and be able to submit that and get a quote or a price without someone saying, oh, he's in this zip code plus four and, you know, or this race or this level of education. If there's a set of parameters that you, that what even a landlord is supposed to look at to evaluate your qualifications, then you can strip out all of that additional data and be able to apply anonymously. Um, so yeah, that was one. Another use case, again, feel free to steal this idea. I think it's going to be one that will eventually matter. And the one company I funded to do this fell on its face. But you, your data, your, whether it's you know, personal data or um, better yet, your genetic data, um, what if you have a rare disease and you have that information, right? You want to share it, but you don't want that associated with you. Again, if there were a way that I could have a tag and be able to share a portion of my genetic sequence anonymously, but know that it's, it's verifiable, I mean, imagine that scenario where I could actually make money doing this instead of... And that's why we brought it. together the book Wealth Care. <laughs> Coming out it. as an NFT in the next few weeks by Alexandria Labs. But Dan, you were going to say. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think for me, uh, so you, you gave what's happening in 2023. I would, I would submit to the audience, at least my perspective, is that we've got about 18 months. We're heading into literally on the fringe of a correction. And you're going to see a correction in the traditional markets and an adjustment in the alternative markets. Over the course of those 18 months, things that will help um, the rebuilding and reconstruction, we were talking about this mark earlier. We are reindustrializing right now in the country at the fastest pace we've ever done it, including post-World War II. So anything that will help that reindustrialization, and so one of the things we're working at is supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. So the application of blockchain technology to the supply chains. Another application that I would say that kind of falls into, Mark, what you were saying, you're talking about zero-knowledge proofs. That's really in the weeds for people. I would say that any, any application or a project that starts to make the application easy. And so I was talking to, for example, somebody, uh, the creator of ZK Snarks, right? That now the next extension is going to be not a single line because ZK Snarks, as everybody here probably knows, is specific to the first, the, each line that you write in. You've got to code each aspect. There's going to be multi-lines so that you can code it for a business case. Anything that will help businesses adopt this technology those are the areas over the next 18 months that I am looking to skyrocket. It hits infrastructure. That's the way that I would articulate, Mark, what you were saying as far as zero knowledge proofs. And I would also say that supply chains, just because of what we're going to see with the liquidity uh, in the banking sector and the impact to traditional uh, markets over the next 18 months. Do you have any specific examples of how it would work in a supply chain? If, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I do, in fact, from the Provenance Chain Network as an example. Um, the, our approach to smart contracts, you've got the discrepancy in supply chains right now. You've got the business experts, the subject matter experts that don't know the code. 
and you've got the technologists that understand the code that don't know the business processes. That's the gap that we have to solve right there. And so for our protocol that we've built allows for the businesses, as an example, to operate just how they were in commercial transactions and let those commercial transactions write their smart contracts. So they can now take their operations the way that they operate today and let that function to build a smart contract with their trading partners. They don't know any code. They operate like they do. And that's an adoption of blockchain, but they will likely never know it. Those are the applications that I think have the chance to succeed over the next 18 months specifically. So now take us forward, assume that we get the infrastructure beautifully done because we have this room full of experts that can build everything according to your descriptions. What does the world look like in five or 10 years from an invest investment point of view? I'm big on the, the actual usability of this stuff, right? It's, it, it comes down to when you go to a website or um, you know, look something up, you don't talk, the Oracle database is there or the MySQL database is there. There's all kinds of different web servers and cloud infrastructure. It's all there, but people don't talk about that. They're like, they just use the end product. And I think there has to be that kind of uh, seamless interaction with all things blockchain and, and crypto. And I think, yeah, over the next five, hopefully closer to five years, not 10, we'll start to see that. Yeah, I, I, I'm hopeful, although I'm not, not super hopeful because the incumbents don't want this to happen. But to me, the biggest change that'll happen in investing is uh, an actual change in investing that we haven't seen really since the 1933 and 1940 acts, which is today pretty much the investing landscape is designed to make a very small number of mutual fund companies really, really rich. Right? Think about 401ks and 403bs, right? It's mandated that you invest in stocks, bonds. Like my daughter was a nurse, is a nurse. Um, she, when she first came out, she says, Dad, will you help me with my 401k? Like, Great. She sends it to me. Seven choices. Four bond funds, three stock funds. It should be against the law for a 24-year-old person to own bonds for at least 40 years until they're in their 60s. It should be against the law. They should only be allowed to own equity, real estate, venture capital, commodities, anything that has a high volatility and low correlation that'll generate wealth. Putting it in GICs and bonds guarantees that they lose and the mutual fund companies make money. Well, why, why does that work that way? Well, because the Tax Act of 1986, it had nothing to do with taxes, had to do with, it was written by BlackRock and, I'm not BlackRock, by Vanguard and Fidelity, they wrote the law to f mandate that companies go from defined benefit, where they actually took care of you in your old age, to defined contribution, where you, who have no experience, meaning the generic you, have no experience in investing, have to take care of your investing. And then they give you shit, pardon the, the French, although I said that once to a French person, they said, why do you say that, we're not vulgar? I don't know, I've never Googled it. Why do you say pardon my French? I don't know. So you have no good choices. And so what I do believe, anyone here have um, in their portfolio the best performing asset over the last 10 years? Collectible Porsches. Anyone have that? I know John Shirley does, right? he owns a bunch of them, but that's the best performing asset the last 10 years. Why? The dentist wrap phenomenon. <laughs> dentist buys said Porsche, does not know how to drive it, wraps it around a tree, exit Porsche, and the ones that are left, John Shirley, Jay Leno, and Jerry Seinfeld bid whatever it takes to own so they can put it in a garage and wipe it with a cloth. I'm like, no, drive it. I mean, do something. But that asset will eventually be tokenized, fractionated, fractionalized, and we'll all be able to own it. And you'll have an AI tool that will constantly rebalance your portfolio. When was the last time you went into your 401k and rebalanced it? You never do that. No one does. No one does. You do, I see. That's good. But most people don't. They, they, on the day one, they get advice from the HR person who's not an investment person. You should pick this. And you know what the average person invests in? One over N. If you've got seven choices, you put one seventh in each. And you never rebalance. That is what the average, and here's the crazier stat. The average person today in America has $44,000 in their 401k. $44,000 to retire. It ain't going to happen. 
I think there's two changes that I'd look for in the next, what you say, five to 10 years, what yeah. we'd think about. So the, the path that we're seeing on this investment thesis is that uh, the US dollar is changing. And what we're already starting to see is the development of regional currencies. And I think that that is going to, it's the east and west model, uh, but you take it and go further. You've got Texas who's looking at potentially backing Bitcoin or a currency with some gold. You've got Wyoming. What's that? Wyoming. Right. Wyoming. Yeah. You're gonna see regional currencies that'll be El Salvador. But you'll also see industrial or industry currencies. You're gonna to start to see currencies that are local. You'll see fractional ownership of, to your point, tokenizing, uh, fractional ownership of an apartment building in your, in your area, and that will be accepted if it's transferable and divisible in digital by the local community as exchange for goods and services. Those will happen. And because you'll start seeing the, fractional, the fractionization of the financial system, You'll also start seeing the second part is, right now capital is, access, is only accessible through banks. But the concept of a bank will not be going to a brick and mortar in five years. It is going to be inside of the brands or the companies. You will be able to, so look, we talked about uh, Starbucks, we started talking about Nike. Those two brands are on the leading edge of using this technology to create and capture transfer value to customers. Apple just opened up a money Apple. market. Those brands are going to have a banking aspect inside of their own brand that will create new capital. Well, it, I, 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 my only pushback is we've seen this movie and it has a dystopian ending. So eight years ago, Alibaba set up a money market account just like uh, Apple just did. And in nine months, it became the third largest money market in the history of money markets. In nine months, it went to $90 billion. And the PBOC changed the banking laws, said that's illegal. Today, it's 260 billion, because it's grown, and they still haven't shut it down, but they didn't let Ant Financial go public, they exiled Jack Ma, and so I agree with you that there's no question we all trust code and, and these brands more than we trust the banks, more than we trust just about anything, but the, the banks, right now control the legislatures. I mean, look, Ms. Warren just announced her campaign platform, I'm assembling an anti-crypto army. Oh my gosh. I mean, literally, that was her new sign for her new campaign. Now, what's ridiculous about that is her largest donor was Sam Bankman freaking Freed, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Actually, mom and dad, not Sam. Sam's the useful idiot. But mom and dad, because she runs the Tumblr that allows venture capitalists to contribute unlimited amounts of money to get around campaign finance laws. Um, but that, that is the only thing that might stop that perfect world in which you describe from happening. Because look, we, we were, in bid, are, were, are big investors in BlockFi. It was our best performing investment that went to zero because, why? Because Operation Choke Point decided, which was funded by the banks, decided that a billion dollars leaves the banks and goes into crypto. Who cares? Nerds and geeks. Mm -hmm. 10 billion? Who cares? 100 billion? Now you're pissing me off. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, you're causing the banking system, which was over levered to begin with, to be vulnerable. And so, but I think about it, if you're gonna pay me zero on my interest in a bank, and I could make six to 8% at BlockFi, why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I move to Apple if they're gonna pay me four and a half percent? I agree. I, it's an observation, not a qualification, right? No judgment on that. I guess I would still submit that we're going to see brands and companies start to absorb this concept. If you've got regional banks, SVB, 16th largest bank in the country, and it's now funding the future for uh, innovation, right? That is gonna be hampered for a decade now. Oh no, they're definitely gonna do it. And I don't know what the number is, but I know personally, if I pull up my phone, I have $127.61 on my Starbucks app. That's such a flex. No, 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 it's not. No, no, I'm just saying just because I reload it because I spend a lot of money on coffee because I'm an idiot. But no, but I actually saw a guy show that he had like $7,000. I'm like, no, that's an idiot. But my point is that how much times everybody else does Starbucks actually have? Isn't that a bank? This is, what, this is the point, right? So if yeah. we don't have lending. It might be a bank. 
from okay. the regional banks. Friends, friends it needs to come from someplace. That's and actually that's what a I would great offer. example. This is what I'm saying. I'm offering the, the thesis. This is how, this is, by the way, this is what we do at water coolers over beers. This is the shit that we talk about, right? right. It's like ridiculous. But if we're going to offer a perspective, a lens, an investment thesis for how to look at the future, consider some of these, these potentials and then start to fast forward the movie. How, to, and how do you get in front of them? And it might be that you, invent, you, you invest in brands that are on the front line. Or you might be thinking about banks that are absorbing or, or approaching new legislation. And you start looking for those investments. That's what I think is going to be important in the next five to ten years. And it's where I'm putting my, that's where I'm advising the families that I'm talking with to think about in far, as far as their investments. And I agree with you in terms of a value. No, but, but, but the but risk common. that that entails, you asked about risk, the risks that that entails, because I couldn't agree more and that's what we're doing, but the risk is you get on the wrong side and some government yep. shuts down. Think about the, the poor investors in Silvergate, although he was a bad guy, but SVB, not bad guys. No. Oh, not I, bad guys at all. All right, but the example, so Oh, one last thing I want okay. to bring up. As Jeff a, gets the last word. The, yeah. um, <laughs> I like to look at also some cases where people weren't necessarily forward thinking in the sense that we might think of, but did it out of necessity. And Bolivia actually has more money in prepaid mobile than they do in the banking system. Wow. <laughs> and that's how they, they transfer value. Fabulous. Well, uh, this group obviously had a very good time. I hope you guys had a good time too. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark, thank Jeff, you. Dan, Thanks. and thank you so much, Ari and T-Mobile, for hosting us. This has been an incredible day, a lot of straight talk, and amazing information. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Hope it was helpful. Oh, and a uh, big round of applause. As Ari thank said, you. I do have some copies if anybody's interested. Thank you. Thank you, Brigetta, Mark, Jeffrey, and Dan. And they will be around, hopefully, to enjoy the plethora of refreshments, deliciousness, and drinks. But first, some closing thoughts from our host and sponsor and everything on this event, um, Dan Thygeson. I'm glad they didn't put my bio up there. That massive picture of me is starting to freak me out a little bit. Um, was that, that was pretty intense today, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was um, to start with um, Mark this morning and sort of get that perspective on, really on, on the world and how, um, you know, cryptocurrencies and Web3 and NFTs and everything sort of has accelerated in a very short period of time and then to project where we think that's going to go. And then throughout the day to sort of have that as the baseline to the rest of the information that gets shared by our panelists and our moderators and the facilitators, and then the, to wrap it up at the end here, I heard one really, really interesting thing at the end. Was it Bolivia? Bolivia has more money in its prepaid wireless system than it does in its banks, and I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> now we know what to aspire to. We need to beat Bolivia, right? Really, really interesting. So um, again, thank you very much um, for all of the contribution. Whether it was up here on the stage, which again, between the two days, was really just phenomenal. Um, or whether it was just interacting with each other in, in the audience, uh, during some social networking, while you have a chance to, to have lunch together or have a cocktail at the end of the day, which we'll, we'll do here and again in a moment. Uh, a really, really interesting and, and valuable exchange of information, uh, the opportunity to meet people and to create some relationships. And again, it goes, it goes back to one of the things I said in the very beginning yesterday. This is about a way to um, develop, enhance, and build on a, on a community here. And I, I'm just super grateful and really, really excited about um, the way this has gone off the last couple of days, the relationships that have been created, the information that's been shared, and really the momentum that is sort of set, set forth and, and initiated for us to, to continue to move forward with. So. Um, Take advantage of the next couple hours to have some food and have some drinks and continue your conversations. And, and um, I made the, the comment earlier today as well, and it's really off of, um, I, just wanna, I just wanna recognize Devin because I, I made a comment earlier today that people are here searching for people to have a conversation, to find the right person to help someone get something across the line. And Devin and I have had this conversation and, and I see it happening here. And so continue that momentum as well. Try to meet as many people as you can. I, I, I say Devin's name because I see Devin and, and every 
Web3 and social event that I've participated in in Seattle and other places. And he is always trying to make connections, meet people, find somebody who has the key to unlock what he is maniacally trying to deliver. And that's a huge opportunity that we can take advantage of here with everyone here together because we get a chance to have those conversations with people that, that might be that key to what you need to unlock what you're trying to accomplish. So please take advantage of that. Again, thank you, thank you so much to Ari. You've done a fantastic job, very much appreciated. Uh, to all of our, our, again, all of our panelists and the moderators and facilitators, it's been an amazing uh, contribution of information and facilitation. And again, to each of you for attending and, and participating in a way that uh, is, is really um, driving meaning and value out of, of, out of using this venue, for example, as a, as a way to facilitate uh, these conversations and these learnings. So enjoy the rest of the, of the evening and the, and the social networking. Be sure to take a look at, at uh, social media. There's a lot of stuff going out on LinkedIn. There's a lot of stuff on Twitter. A lot of stuff I see is moving around on, on uh, Instagram as well. And uh, thank you so, so very much. Yeah, absolutely. Have a great night.
You're golden. <laughs> 